Welcome to the Foul Play YouTube channel. Hey, thanks, Alice. Greetings and hello to everyone. Thanks for coming along today with us on Open Mic number 102. And today we're going to be going back to the Coburn v. Netflix uh, disaster. I mean, doc, uh, lawsuit. Did I say disaster? I got to tell you, it, it really is. Uh, it really is kind of a disaster. There's been a number of documents that have dropped since Friday. They continue to drop. Terry uh, actually linked a couple um, today that that have dropped. Certainly, we're not going to get that far. But and there's not as many in this document dump as there was. Um, the last in, in, in October, uh, that was, Jesus, that was a massive amount. We're going to read what's relevant. If we get into areas that are, you know, trial testimony, we're not going to read it. So, or motions and that kind of thing. But the things that are new and interesting, I, I think that if, if you're really going to follow and, and understand what Ludwig has to look at, we really kind of have to dig. And uh, I, I know a lot of it's mundane and can get boring as shit. I get it. We all do. But again, if you don't look and read it, you're not going to know. So with that said, uh, let's greet everyone here in Discord that's joined us today. Alice. You're muted, Alice. You can't hear us. You can't talk if you're muted. Yeah, once again, I'm like, hello, everybody, and I'm back in you. <laughs> Hello everyone on chat, uh, hi everyone on the panel, it is great to have you all with us, great to have Sammy back with us, um, which is wonderful, and looking forward to what these files are going to show. Thank you Alice, thank you, thank you, and of course uh, we've got the indomitable Susan. Indomitable. Mm, that's right. Can't be beat. Inexplicable. That too. Hi, everybody. I am feeling better despite how my voice sounds. So glad to be here, Jack. Thanks for that's hosting. A, absolutely. And then, of course, we got Jinxie. Hi, everyone. Hope you're all well. Not sure Neverly can talk. She's at work sneaking around during surgery and so forth, brain surgery. He never. Don't tell anybody. Okay. Hello, everybody. Yeah, let's keep it a secret. Absolutely. Well, your thanks. secret is safe with <laughs> us and yeah, all we, of YouTube. <laughs> we won't tell us so. <laughs> Promise. And of course, Africa. Well, I can come with you. Hi, hello, hello. It's nice to actually make an open mic for once. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you live a busy life, man. We understand. Real life got to come first. And, and yeah, of course, Sammy. Yeah. Sammy's driving, but maybe she can say hello while uh, while she's listening. Hello. Thank you for the welcome. Absolutely. Well, thanks for coming. We appreciate that. So let's say hello to everyone in the live chat that's made the, on this Monday afternoon. Who we got here? I see right off the bat Dr. Soakman. Uh, not too early for him. He's probably had a coffee or two. Hopefully he can maybe jump in if he has time and uh, get on the panel. And then Pete Moss, Cher, Five Coolidge. Uh, there's Andy B. Uh, who else we got here? Iced Coffee. Gloria, thanks for coming. Hey, uh, who else we got here? There's Case 10 out of the Sunfield and probably... Hopefully they're still in Nebraska. Hopefully they haven't driven their combine over to, you know, Kansas or somewhere. <laughs> JD as well. We've got JD in as well. Yep. And Kay. Bethany. There's Kay and Bethany. Yep. Hey, thanks for and coming. JD. Up. Is Angie here? Not that I've seen oh. unless she was about the rock. Um, I thought you I thought you said Angie. I, I apologize. Oh, Maz has just joined us. Hello, Maz. Pete Moss. Excellent. All right. Well, we uh, certainly. JJ. Hi, JJ. Oh, yep. Yeah, JJ, that's my oldest boy. Yep. Where's Glenn? Thanks for dropping by. And the gal is pretty sick, too, Susan. He he feels pretty crappy. So he said he was going to try to tune in, but he said he might pass out. He's, he's, pretty, he's got 
I think the same Aww. crud. Yeah, I think he's got the same crud that, that that you're recovering from. He's pretty sick. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, it, it's going around. It, better soon. It, yeah, it's going around. So. Uh, yeah, we're gonna pass the hat around like we try to do in reading these documents, so not one person is read to death. Uh, just a little background before we jump into them. Um, you know, we really kind of finished on 298, the document dump, the ma the major document dump. And there's been a few others that are pilfered in over the last uh, three weeks or so. And then one specifically from Brenda Schuler. You know, she wants her, all of her, the Brenda Schuler documents, she wants all that stuff kept um, locked up and you know, uh, under seal. No, don't want it out there. Netflix, they don't want their camera A footage released. They want all that kept, stuff kept under seal. So that's kind of where we are. Also, there was a submission by um, the Coburn team to expand their um, word count and their reply. Normally limited to thirty. Yeah, they're normally limited, limited to thirty pages, and they wanted forty-five. So this is a text-only order. Uh, don't be difficult. Yeah, this is a text-only order uh, from Ludwig. Uh, signed by Ludwig on 1028, referencing 303. Um, motion to clarify. This is a motion to clarify. There was another motion um, because there was some I don't know. I guess they thought that the word, the wording of the actual motion was weird. Anyway, this combined response is on down here. This combined response may exceed the 30 page limit imposed by civil LR uh, 56 B8. That said, the court expects that the that combining the responses will result in some efficiency and while not a requirement, suggests that plaintiff could likely make this case in 65 to 70 pages. Again, the court looks kindly on concise arguments. So, he, I think he's being pretty clear. Don't run over a bunch of uh, unnecessary stuff. It's just gonna it's just gonna make you mad. So there's that one. Now we're gonna start. That's. Um, I have a question for you, real quick. All of the docs that have been dropped now, you think is that part of their reply that they're getting extra wording for? Because uh, how much of that is bullshit stuff that they're adding <laughs> yeah it's uh, there they they responded yeah. yeah they responded okay i forget how many pages it is 78 maybe and yeah i'm not even I, I, i'm not even sure well he's he told him to try to keep it 65 to 70 pages but that i guess they head up to but they Can't could remember. go up to nine, nine, up to ninety, yeah, up to ninety. Minutes. Yes, wow. correct. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, we're starting on actually document three hundred five. I scroll down there so bad you could see. It's a two page document. Um. So. I know that Sapper Cop it can't stay very long. Sapper, do you uh, do you have time to read this one, or do you want me to pass the hat on to someone? Else? He may be on the phone. That's fine. Uh, Alice, you feel like reading this one? You can't hear me. I can hear you now. Oh, okay. I was like, wait a minute, I'm not muted. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna read this. Sure. All right, go for it. Whenever you're ready. read from the screen here. All right, so plaintiff's motion to temporarily restrict as to video evidence. Pursuant to Rule 5.2 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and Civil Local Rule 7094, plaintiff, by his undersigned counsel, respectfully moves the court to restrict from public access video evidence contained on a removable drive that is being submitted separately to the court by courier for delivery tomorrow, November 4th, 2022. Until the court decides the merits of certain defendants' motions to restrict access to such materials. In support of this motion, plaintiff states as follows. One, 
Defendants Chrome Media LLC, Laura Riccardi, and Maura DeMoss, DeMoss, I don't know how you say that, DeMoss, have filed a motion to restrict access to raw footage of the Stephen Avery trial, claiming that there is good cause to do so, docket number 280 at pages 1 through 6. Two, the removal drive that is arriving by courier as part of plaintiff's response to defendant's summary judgment motions contains Chrome footage of the Avery trial. Now, when they say chrome, are they talking about metal? That'd be strange. <laughs> Number three, <laughs> plaintiff has opposed chrome's motion, see docket 298, but plaintiff requests that the court accept the material under seal until it can decide the merits of chrome's motion. Scroll down a little bit more. Oh, well, that's it. Yep, submitted by April uh, Barker. Rock as Ed Barker. Hey, that's a... That's a pretty rocking name there. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? Um, so. Yeah, I was just, sorry, I was just uh, reading this co-counsel. Yeah, this George Burnett character. Okay. Um, okay, so that's, that's 305. Not much to it, but a uh, little request. And this one, I think, is the, sh the shipping, the e-filing. I think that's what it is. I don't remember. I've scanned at these, but I, I honestly have read very little. Uh, this looks like a federal, via Federal Express, um, an e-filing clerk at U.S. District Court, Eastern District, the Milwaukee Division, regarding this uh, Coburn v. Netflix. Is the case. Uh, dear, dear clerk, plaintiff will electronically file a brief in opposition to defendant's motion for summary judgment and supporting defendants enclosed. Please found the following. One, a flash drive containing Exhibit 1 to the de declaration of Andrew Coburn. Voicemail recordings received on on office phone line while working at the Manitowoc County Sheriff's between 1-3-2016 and 11-16-2016. As produced in discovery, were produced in discovery as Colburn, and it gives the uh, number there. Two, a flash drive containing exhibits three, four, and five to the declaration of April Rockstead Barker. Uh, EX3 comparison video showing raw footage produced by the defendants, labeled Chrome. And it gives the number, and it gives the episodes. I'm not going to read all that, but uh, basically it's the Filmmakers' camera A footage, the, the raw footage that they have produced under seal. The flash drive contains the flash drive containing exhibits three, four, and five to the declaration of April Rockstead Barker is marked as confidential, and the subject of the notice of motion and motion to file under seal also being filed electronically. Hey, Jeff. You. Oh, I just figured out what um, that number one up there. That would be all the um, kind of hate calls that they got um, right after Ma'am came out. Yeah. I think the, the, yeah. Re the recordings is talking Ab about. Exhibit one. Yeah. Absolutely agree. Yeah. Yeah. And then Law Firm of Conway. Can we FOIA those? I don't see why not. Yeah, that would be an open record request. Absolutely. We, you could just give old Todd a call. He's your good friend, you know, Mr. Cummings. Hey, Todd, need some stuff. You don't like me at all. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on. Now, we're getting into a 20-page document here, so we can kind of split the, the, the duty up here. Again, uh, I'm going to offer this to Saprikop because he has to leave here before too long. If he, if he wants to read, you don't have to read it all. You can read however, however much portion you want. And hand it off. It's fine. I'm sure we'll probably take a pause in it at some point anyways. You good with reading? Uh, I am. Uh, I'm going to blow this up. Uh, yeah, I can hear. I'm going to blow this up just a tick. Uh, that's going to come in there just a little bit bigger for you if you're reading from the screen. Got it. Looks good to me. All right. Whenever you're Defendant Netflix Inc.'s opposition to plaintiff's motion for partial summary judgment. 
Plaintiff Andrew Colburn's motion for partial summary judgment must be denied. Colburn fails to set forth the standards he must meet to be entitled to summary judgment, ignores and denies that he has the burden of proof, and does not explain how the scant evidence he cites actually supports judgment in his favor. Instead, Colburn misstates much of the law and facts. Wow, they are going to town. Uh, he also <laughs> he also advises the court that no matter the outcome of his motion, he intends to present to the jury some unspecified number of other purportedly defamatory statements, video footage, graphics, and perhaps even music. Colburn's refusal to narrow these the issues in this case, even when asking for summary judgment, continues. Colburn's MPSJ lists 52 of what he calls quote-unquote statements or quote-unquote embellishments, many of which are on their face, not about him. He does not explain how these 52 disparate pieces of the 10-hour Making a Murderer series are false or defamatory. Indeed, many of them are indisputably true. And Colburn now introduces a new theory into the case as it ages well into its fourth year, defamation by implication. But he does not explain how any of these 52 statements support the purported uh, purported defamatory implication that he either planted evidence to frame Stephen Avery for the murder of Theresa Halbach or participated in a broader conspiracy to do so. Meanwhile, he ignores Seventh Circuit case law on defamation by innuendo, apparently believing that he can prove a defamatory implication just by saying it exists. And he makes no attempt to actually prove, as is his burden, that the implication he imagines is false. The only proposed fact he proffers in support of his claim is that he did not plant evidence in his own self-serving denial. If that were sufficient to grant summary judgment in his favor, there could be no documentaries on any disputed issue without liability. Finally, he ignores the heightened burden he faces as a public official to prove that Netflix released Mam with no constitutional actual malice. Colburn's MPSJ must be denied. Argument. To obtain summary judgment on a defamation claim, a plaintiff must present evidence to prove that the defendant, one, published, two, a false, three, defamatory, and four, unprivileged statement. And then there's a little bit of case law they cite there. As a conceded public official, Colburn must also prove by clear and convincing evidence, five, that Netflix distributed MAM with the constitutionally mandated level of fault, actual malice, meaning publishing a false statement of fact knowingly or with a high degree of awareness of its probable falsity. And then some more case law. This is an exceedingly high burden and despite an exhaustive search, Counsel for Netflix was unable to find a single decision from the Seventh Circuit or any federal or state court in Wisconsin in which a public figure plaintiff like Colburn successfully moved for summary judgment on the issue of actual malice against a media defendant like Netflix. Certainly, Colburn has not cited any such case from this jurisdiction or any other. In any event, Colburn does not cite record evidence that would meet his burden of proof on any of the five elements he must prove. Other than the publication of MAM, which Netflix has never disputed, he does not even acknowledge the heightened burden he faces under the First Amendment, or frankly, that he has any burden at all. Colburn so badly misstates defamation law that a ruling in his favor would turn decades of settled precedent on its head. I... Colburn ignores or upends the burdens he faces at summary judgment. Colburn completely ignores, and thus does not begin to satisfy, the standards he must meet under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 56, where, as here, the movement has the burden of proof on the claim on which he is moving for summary judgment. He, quote-unquote, must lay out the elements of the claim, cite the facts which he believes satisfies these elements, and demonstrate why the record is so one-sided as to rule out the prospect of a finding in favor of the non-movement on the claim, and then some case law. Colburn does not do that. Instead, he either misstates or ignores the standards that he, not Netflix, must meet to prevail on the disputed elements of his defamation claim. A. 
Colburn misstates his burden to prove falsity. Colburn fundamentally misstates the burden of proof on falsity, claiming that defendants have the burden to prove the truth. And that's summary judgment at five. And here we go with the footnote. Colburn misleadingly cites said case law in support of the motion that to defeat his summary judgment, defendants must prove the truth of the quote unquote statements he challenges. That portion of Garal involves a defendant's affirmative defense of truth in a private figure case against a non-media defendant, not a public official's lawsuit against a media defendant where the plaintiff has the affirmative burden to prove falsity. And then some more case law. Now back up to our section there. He could not be more wrong. Colburn, not, not defendants, must prove that Mam conveyed false statements of facts about him to reasonable viewers. And some more case law. Since he never acknowledges that he has the burden to prove falsity, Colburn also never acknowledges that his burden is to prove material falsity. That's to say the statements would have a different and more damaging effect on the mind of a reasonable viewer than the precise truth. And that's case law. He also disregards that only statements of verifiable fact can be false. That is, opinions, speculation, and hyperbole are not actionable as defamation, nor are questions, theories, or conjectures. Case law. And by pointing to dozens of scattered snippets of ma'am, he ignores the settled law that such quote-unquote statements must be analyzed in the context of ma'am as a whole to assess his new and misguided, claim that the snippets somehow imply as incontrovertible fact that he participated in an evidence-planting conspiracy. And it's a bunch of case law. Taken together, these settled principles mean that Colburn must prove that a reasonable viewer, considering the challenge statements in the context of his entire 10-hour span of MAM, would understand MAM, and more specifically Netflix, to be making affirmative statements of defamatory fact about Colburn. In other words, Colburn must cite record evidence conclusively, demonstrating that reasonable viewers would understand MAM and Netflix to be adopting or endorsing Avery's accusations and presenting those accusations as fact, even though they constitute just one of the several inherently conflicting viewpoints that the series documents in telling the story of Avery's trial, where his accusations were obviously hotly disputed. Assuming he can clear that hurdle, he cannot, Colburn must then prove those accusations to be false. Netflix does not have to prove that any one of the 52 statements Colburn points to is true, though many of them are. Netflix also does not have to prove Avery's innocence or that Colburn planted evidence to ensure Avery's conviction for Hallbox murder. Rather, for Colburn to succeed in establishing defamation by implication and innuendo, he must affirmatively prove the alleged implication is false. He must prove that he did not plant evidence to ensure Avery's conviction. He does not grapple with this at all. You guys, want to break here just, just for just for just a moment. Damn this it! Is, I was yeah. <laughs> Talk about scathing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ripping this him is, in half, well, I think would be a good way to is, it. Yeah, it's so well written. I love it. Oh, this is Lita, right? Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> you take her, you know, it's like, uh, it's like that they, they came to her in a knife fight and she brought a bazooka. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. It's so good. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, anyone else before we continue on with B? You're, I, I gotta tell you, there, uh, Sapricov, you're a fantastic reader, dude. I've already gotten comments. Fantastic. On, fantastic. I I, I've gotten yeah. DMs. It's like, this guy, like, pro professional. professional. Absolutely. Yeah. Ah. So you're on the fucking payroll, dude. That's all I got to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't come cheap, you know? Yeah. Well, that's all right. So uh, all right. Point two point nine billion dollars. <laughs> One of us are going to win the two billion, so we'll be good. Um, <laughs> any other comments before we continue? Continue on. All right. Whenever you're ready. Uh, right. B. 
Colburn ignores his burden on innuendo and other elements. Colburn's new theory of defamation by implication by innuendo requires yet another showing, assuming the court even permits him to introduce this never before pleaded theory of liability years into this case. Under clear Seventh Circuit precedent, to establish defamation by quote unquote innuendo, Colburn must prove by clear and convincing evidence that Netflix intended, or at least knew, that reasonable viewers would understand MAM itself to be drawing conclusions about Colburn's culpability. Case law. He cannot do that. Instead, Colburn argues as if this requirement does not exist. Beyond proof of falsity, Colburn also has the burden as to each challenge statement, as well as the overarching alleged quote-unquote implication, to prove that each statement and implication, one, is about, of, and concerning him, that two, it is not privileged, and three, it is defamatory in the sense that it subjects him, not someone else, to public hatred, contempt, or ostracism. Case law. Yet again, he ignores these burdens. C. Colburn disregards his heightened burden on actual malice. Finally, Colburn disregards the extraordinary burden he faces as a public official regarding actual malice. Colburn must prove by clear and convincing evidence that Netflix distributed MAM knowing that each of the challenged statements and alleged implications about Colburn were false or being highly aware that they were probably false. Case law. On summary judgment, Colburn must set forth undisputed material facts that would support a reasonable jury's finding of actual malice by clear and convincing evidence. A bunch of case law noting that the plaintiff is required to prove clearly and convincingly that the quote-unquote defendant in fact entertains serious doubts as to the publication's truth. This burden is, by design, a daunting one and obviously demands significant time and attention. Yet the phrase quote-unquote clear and convincing evidence is nowhere to be found in Colburn's MPSJ. Nor does Colburn even attempt to tie any of his purported evidence of actual malice pulled from just three discrete sets of notes Netflix pro provided to the producer defendants to any of the 52 quote-unquote statements he puts at issue in his motion or the alleged evidence planting implication. Colburn does not even bother to define what quote-unquote actual malice means or address the fact that he has the burden to prove it. Footnote number two. Colburn's counsel was, uh, are well aware of the standards for showing actual malice on summary judgment, having successfully defended a television station on those grounds in a case that went to the Wisconsin Court of Appeals and some case law. Colburn's failure to cite the standards for determining the issues on which he seeks summary judgment, let alone apply those standards to the record evidence, warrants denial of his... Uh, did we miss a page? Okay, anyway, it's got some MPSJ of his summary judgment. Yeah. Yeah. Court properly denied summary judgment where a moving party did not, uh, quote unquote, did not even cite the standard for determining the relevant issue, let alone apply that standard to the record facts. The court need go no further to dispose of this meritless motion. Yikes. Man, she's got a big knife. Mm -hmm. Two, Colburn cannot prove the challenged statements or their alleged implications are actionable. Even if Colburn had properly acknowledged the relevant standards, Colburn's MPSJ fails because the facts he sets forth fail to satisfy his burden to prove that the portions of MAM he challenges are actionable as defamation. A. Standing alone, not one of the 52 challenge statements is actionable because not one is a false statement of fact about Colburn. More than a third of Colburn's MPSJ consists of a 52-item chart of what he calls, quote-unquote, Statements and or MAM embellishments. MPSJ at page six. Colburn does not present evidence showing that any one of these 52 statements is false. As a result of his failure to even attempt to show falsity, the court can and should dismiss each of the 52 statements as non-actionable without further analysis. Nevertheless, for the court's convenience and the sake of completeness, Netflix attaches an appendix here to summarizing the multiple reasons why each of the 52 items is not actionable. Those, reasonable, those reasons include, quote unquote statements, bunch of numbers, are not even statements. They are descriptions of video images 
graphics, and still photos displayed in MAM. Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> uh, second bullet. Um, statement numbers are not statements of fact. Rather, they consist of or contain either unverifiable speculation or conjecture or are statements of hyperbole or the speaker's opinion and therefore not actionable. Bullet number three. Uh, statement numbers. To the extent construed as statements of verifiable fact are true or substantially true. Uh, bullet number four. A uh, bunch of numbers are not even about Colburn. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> bullet number five. Uh, several statements are substantially identical to statements made at Avery's murder trial and therefore not actionable because they are based on true or privileged facts. And the last bullet. Colburn's descriptions of statements, numbers, 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 are incomplete, misleading, and or lack proper context. The majority of the entries on Colburn's chart are so subsidiary or peripheral to his claims that he did not even mention them in the body of the SAC, relegating them instead to Exhibit A and failing, even now, to explain how they are false or defamatory, despite his burden to do so. Take statement three as an example. To meet his burden to show the statement is false, Colburn would need to prove that the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office did not have evidence in 1985 that Avery was innocent, or that someone in the Sheriff's Office did say something about that lack of evidence against Avery. Colburn has no such evidence. Likewise, with regard to statement four, he would need to prove that Manitowoc County was prepared to hand Avery $36 million. Again, Colburn has no such evidence. The list goes on as Colburn has failed to come forward with any evidence of the falsity of any of these statements. Despite putting 52 statements at issue in his motion, his argument on falsity runs for a total of just three paragraphs, covering less than half a page. Even though he bears the burden in this case and on summary judgment to prove falsity, he does not attempt to even explain what about these challenged quote unquote statements is false. B. Collectively, the 52 challenge statements do not support Colburn's new, implied libel theory. Regardless, he has not proved the alleged implication false. Instead of explaining why he believes each of the 52 items is materially false, Colburn asserts in sweeping terms that they, quote-unquote, collectively imply or insinuate that plaintiff or a group of law enforcement officers that included him planted evidence to frame Stephen Avery for murder. And he claims that the implication is false. His quote-unquote proof? He says he didn't do it. There are many problems with this argument, beyond the fact that Colburn did not actually plead a defamation by implication claim in any of the three iterations of his complaint. First, as the appendix demonstrates, the vast majority of the 52 quote-unquote statements simply do not say what Colburn claims that Colburn planted evidence. For example, statements 3 through 29 and 38 cannot be reasonably interpreted as accusing Colburn of planting evidence of the Hallbach case because they are exclusively about the quote-unquote jail call he received in or around 1995, the misconduct surrounding Avery's wrongful conviction in 1985, and Avery's post-exoneration civil rights lawsuit. At most, these statements go to the possibility that Colburn had a motive to frame Avery, which is true. In allowing Avery to accuse Colburn and just one other officer, James Link, of evidence planting as part of Avery's defense for Hallbach's murder, Judge Patrick Willis found as a matter of law that Colburn did indeed have such a motive. And they did point that out. Regardless, a statement that a person has a motive to commit wrongdoing is not a statement accusing that person of actually committing wrongdoing. Well, that's brilliant. It is. <laughs> Second, Colburn does not address his burden to show that, considering the documentary in full and the challenge statements in context, Mam actually conveyed a, to a reasonable viewer that, as a matter of incontrovertible fact, Colburn planted evidence to frame Avery for Hallbach's murder or conspired to do so. Mam does not make any such assertion. It simply reflects the fact that such allegations were made by Avery and his defense counsel then reiterated by his relatives and supporters 
in the controversial uh, yeah, controversial Halbach. Ooh. Oops, sorry. My bad. Uh, Halbach murder case. Third, oh, wait, I think we have a footnote. Scroll down to the bottom of the page for the footnote. Big foot. Oh, that's a big one, yeah. So this body of law causes the foundation upon which Colburn's entire case is built, an overly simplistic summary of the Republication Doctrine, to crumble. This doctrine does not override the fact that courts evaluating whether statements are actionable must consider the full context in which they are published. Con uh, quote unquote, context is key as it matters not only what was said, but who said it, where it was said, and the broader setting of the challenge statements. The Seventh Circuit has repeatedly held that reports representing, or excuse me, presenting conflicting allegations as allegations, not fact, particularly in publications involving government activities, such as investigations or court proceedings, are not actionable under the publication theory. And then another piece of uh, case law holding news media report or news media could report on government investigation without having to prove the truth of the allegations being investigated. Colburn's own brief acknowledges that the republication doctrine applies most often to unsubstantiated quote unquote rumors, a far cry from the public trial and surrounding controversy that was the subject of MAM. All right, now we can scroll back to the, uh, yeah, right there. Third, to prove defamation by implication, Colburn has to prove by clear and convincing evidence that Netflix intended for viewers to understand MAM to be asserting as incontrovertible fact that Colburn planted or conspired to plant evidence, or at least knew that reasonable viewers might interpret MAM as making such a false, or excuse me, such a factual assertion. Colmer does not even attempt to point to evidence that would support such a conclusion by any standard, let alone the clear and convincing standard, dooming his motion on the issue to failure. And some case law, fact that alleged defamatory implication was reasonable, did not overcome defendants, quote unquote, uncontradicted affidavits, they were unaware of such implication. Fourth, even if Colburn could somehow establish the implication that he alleges, he cannot, he cannot meet his burden to prove falsity. In other words, if the crux of Colburn's lawsuit and his MPSJ is that Mam accuses him of planning evidence to frame Avery, then he has the burden to prove that he did not plant evidence to prevail on summary judgment on the issue of falsity. But the only evidence Colburn points to on the issue of falsity is his own testimony at Avery's murder trial that he did not plant evidence. This is no more than what he did in the SAC. This is insufficient to show Mam committed, communicated a false statement of fact about him, particularly because Mam included Colburn's testimony denying he planted evidence. A plaintiff's self-serving testimony, standing alone, cannot entitle him to summary judgment on an issue where he has the burden of proof. And so yeah, some case law, summary judgment movement bearing burden of proof must show evidence, quote unquote, is so one-sided that they must prevail as a matter of law, cleaned up. If such evidence were sufficient, every defamation plaintiff would be entitled to summary judgment on the issue of material falsity because plaintiffs always deny that the thing defendants said about them is true. They must say that in order to state a claim. Yet plaintiffs rarely succeed in such efforts. Colburn has not cited a single case where a plaintiff established falsity as a matter of law. Contrary to Colburn's false contentions, Netflix does not have to affirmatively show that Colburn planted evidence to defeat his motion. In fact, Netflix does not. Oh, I guess we missed a. Uh, you did miss, miss a that. Yeah, there's a yeah. number four. Yeah, that footnote there. Okay, uh, let's see. Moreover, Colburn's views that he should be believed simply because he testified under oath as a sworn law enforcement officer, Netflix's additional proposed findings of fact reveals a degree of naivete, if not entitlement. Ooh. No shit. As current, <laughs> as current events have shown all too clearly and tragically, it is a fact that even sworn law enforcement officers sometimes engage in serious misconduct, including perjury. 
Although both lying to convict, uh, excuse me, both lying to convict the innocent and lying to convict the guilty both deserve condemnation. The latter is more resistant to change and the more prevalent. Lying to convict the guilty is so common and so accepted in some jurisdictions that the police themselves have come up with a name for it. Quote, unquote, testa lying. Yeah, we have heard that one before. Um, and some case law describing various ways rules of criminal procedure encourage police to commit perjury to secure conviction and difficulties inherent in trying to fix these incentives. Oh, yeah. Oh, starting at, uh, starting at, con uh, if you want to go back to the. Yeah, uh, yeah so we'll do that last time. Okay. So, contrary to Colburn's false contentions, Netflix does not have to affirmatively show that Colburn planted evidence to defeat his motion. In fact, Netflix does not even have to point to contradictory facts in the records because, quote unquote, a party opposing summary judgment does not have to rebut factual propositions on which the movement bears the burden of proof and that the movement has not properly supported in the first instance. Because Colburn has failed to meet his burden to provide evidence that any of the challenge statements or alleged implications are false or otherwise actionable, his summary judgment must be denied. All right, I think I can go ahead and hand off to somebody. Fantastic job, Sapper Cobb. Bravo, man. Awesome, Sapper. Thank you. Absolutely. I was famous once, but we'll make that another story. <laughs> you, uh, uh, you, you got the invoice ready, right? Right. <laughs> send, uh, yeah. send that to Zoe in care of Zoe. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, we can discuss just for a, a brief moment. Um, again, I say Wardy. she brought a bit. Um, Wardy does said, who's that reading? Sounds like the guy from Audit the Audit. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> oh, Audit That's the Audit? That's a good channel. Audit the Audit. It's a, a YouTube channel. And yeah, I, I know. I, I, I like it. Yeah. You know, yeah. Sep yeah. Sep Sep got a fantastic reading voice and the good uh um cadence cadence i guess that's yeah it's very 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 articulate and uh outstanding we're lucky to have him with us to do that and i, I really appreciate you know people that you know it it's one thing to say you know i've read a document and, and all that but to read to people i can tell you right now just going through it myself it's more difficult than you think and that he's reading from my the screen that i'm scrolling uh, but, uh on YouTube, so it, that adds another uh, extra little uh, little burden to it. So, anyway, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, thank God there's not too much of a delay. Um, so. No, it's good. It's good. Silkman and, said uh, he would buy a used car from Sapper, and uh, Case Ten said, "Doc, I heard he has a Rav for sale." <laughs> <laughs> you got. Yeah, I might have a I might have a AMG Gremlin uh, somewhere out in the back. I could give you there, Doc. Old Dodge Duster. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I still think that um, these people have brought a a couple of dull uh, drawn outs to. Uh, says, to says which one. <laughs> <laughs> They bought a. They, they brought a couple of dull knives to uh, lead us, Lita Walker's bazooka fight, and they're going to lose. She doesn't, you know. And uh, maybe I shouldn't say this, but uh, I'm going to say it anyway, just based on everything we've seen from her. I would love to see her. I know she's not a criminal attorney. I would love to see her take Avery's case and that and Brendan's case. She is so. She is so articulate. Uh, yeah, when 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 Zellner went at uh, in, in some of her rebuts to uh, Judge Sucks at this, she was she was like this. So this is very indicative of a, of a really good lawyer who knows how to word things certain ways, and yeah, phenomenal. Absolutely, she she is so good. So uh, all right. What uh, what you mean you mean Colburn ain't entitled? <laughs> you think he is right? And I will tell you, I think the next document they're talking about this this table. I think this next document after this, and we'll get to it here in a few minutes. But I think it does lay out uh, various statements and, and and some other things that I think is is really interesting. 
again, she's made it exceedingly easy for the judge to follow, right? So, yep. Uh, okay, um, Susan, do you feel like reading any at all today? If you don't, it's fine. We can we can take care. No, of Jack, I don't. I I can't. I don't have the voice. Sorry. That's okay. That's all right. Alice, <coughs> what about you? Are you up for a reading for a bit? Yeah, sure. No problem. I don't know if I'll be as good as Sapper, but I'll get a try. <laughs> well, he set a damn high bar for us, so don't feel bad. I, I got you. But, uh, uh -huh. well, all right, you can start at number three there whenever you're ready. Okay, number three. Colburn cannot prove Netflix distributed man with actual malice. Even if Colburn had set forth the standards he must meet to prevail on actual malice at the summary judgment stage, his MPSJ would still be inadequate. Colburn's actual malice argument fails for two reasons. First, as explained Supra, Colburn has fa failed to carry his burden to prove the statements he puts at issue and, and the implications he alleges are false. There can be no knowledge of falsity where a statement is not false. To recover for defamation, public official must first prove statement at issue was false. Second, Colburn does not address how the limited evidence he cites would support what he must clearly and convinc convincingly prove, that Netflix knew the specific challenge statements and alleged implications were false or had a high degree of awareness they were probably false. Uh, case law. To the contrary, not once in his MPSJ does Colburn assert with or without evidence that Netflix or any other defendant knew or had any awareness that anything in MAM about Colburn was probably false. This failure, failure alone dooms Colburn's MPSJ on the issue of actual malice. Instead, Colburn relies on a preposterous mischaracterization <laughs> of, a, <laughs> of a seminal case, St. Amit, as the cornerstone of his entire actual malice argument. Colburn asserts that St. Amit stands for the propor proportions that actual malice can be shown by reliance on, quote, sources that are unverified or anonymous, unquote. MPSJ at five, and that actual malice, quote, actual malice can be found as a matter of law under the standard articulated in St. Amit because of the evident inherent basis of the sources, unquote. MPSJ at 13. That is not what the Supreme Court said in that case, and Colburn's gross mischaracterization is the opposite of the law. Actual malice may be found, the Supreme Court says, quote, where a story is fabricated by the defendant as the product of his imagination or is based wholly on an unverified anonymous telephone call, unquote. 309 U.S. at 732, emphasis added. The court did wow. not say... Well, the court I mean, it's, it's amazing yeah. that they used that case. God yes. damn. <laughs> so Jesus. Good. She's absolutely just stabbing the hell out of them. Just bam. bam. Yeah. Yeah, the gross mischaracterization. <laughs> yeah, I saw yeah. that and I'm like, holy shit, there's a, there's a fucking uppercut. Anyway, go ahead. Whenever you're Unverified anonymous calls as well. I mean, it's just it's brilliant. It's absolutely yeah. brilliant. <laughs> or a product of their imagination. What was the first one? Was uh yeah, uh, where a story know. is fabricated by the defendant. Right, like they made the whole thing up. Just made the shit or, up. Yeah, it's just a product of their imagination. Or from an unverified phone is call. The, is, the art is based wholly 
on unverified anonymous telephone calls. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> the court did not say that quote and biased sources was evidence of actual malice. And it is well settled that bias, whether by the publisher or their sources, is insufficient. Uh, case law. Speakers strongly negative feelings about plaintiff were not proof of actual malice. Allegations that speaker was ideological opponent of plaintiff who published statements to further a political agenda did not show actual malice. Self-interest and politics m motivate many news sources if dealing with such persons were to constitute evidence of actual malice, must news gathering would be severely chilled, cleaned up. The purported evidence of actual malice that Colburn does cite notes by Netflix employees and one of the filmmakers do not even hint at any knowledge or awareness of any false statements of fact about Colburn. Many of the reference notes undermine Colburn's argument and most have nothing to do with the challenged quote-unquote statements at all. The notes mention only one of the statements Colburn challenges while alluding to another. Neither shows that any change was made to the statements, content or placement within MAM as a result of Netflix suggestions. Colburn points to a note from Netflix that mentions what he has labelled as Statement 4, a statement by Avery's cousin, Kim Ducat, that she felt Manitowoc County was, quote-unquote, not done with Avery when he was released from prison in 2003. MPSJ at 13, Colburn falsely asserts that the note suggested the filmmakers used Ducat's quote quote, to impart a more explicit ending to an earlier earlier episode that makes it clear that in the next episode, the cops are going to seek revenge. MPSJ at 13. But the note does not suggest using the Ducat quote that way or even changing its placement within the episode. It simply states that Ducat's quote is near the beginning of the working version of episode one, where it remained in the final version distributed by Netflix. Cousin says, quote, be careful. They aren't even close to being done with you, unquote. Meanwhile, the suggestion that, quote, the cops are going to seek revenge, unquote, which is nothing more than a summary of Avery's allegations at his murder trial, and no way indicates that the author knew or suspected that was a false statement of fact. In the cited portion of Lisa, Lisa Nishimura's deposition testimony, she mer merely states that the document does appear to be a set of notes Netflix transmitted to the filmmakers. Nishimura specifically says she did not author the document, but that she probably contributed to it. Docket 286, Exhibit 8. Colburn also refers to a statement in one of the notes that it, quote, seems very thin that Colburn, not having specific knowledge about who called him, would be the key to the case, unquote. Referring to the jail call Colburn received in or around 1995. MPSJ at 14. Colburn implies that the note somehow contradicts Statement 25 by one of Avery's civil lawyers, Stephen Glenn, that the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office's failure to follow up on the jail call was, quote, as close to a conspiracy of silence as I think you could find in a case, unquote. However, setting aside that Glenn's statement is a non-actionable opinion, the note is simply an observation about the significance of the jail call. 
It is not about its truth or falsity. No one disputes that the call occurred or that it played a central role in both Avery's civil lawsuit for wrongful imprisonment and his trial for Holbach's murder. Least of all, Colburn, who has testified about it repeatedly. Beyond these two examples, there is other, otherwise a complete mismatch between the 52 items that are subject of Colburn's motion and the evidence of actual malice he says he has. Without any evidence supporting his position, Colburn resorts to more false characterizations of the notes. For example, Colburn cobbles together isolated phrases from two different sets of notes to assert that Netflix had some, quote, preconceived law enforcement conspiracy narrative, unquote. MPSJ at 13. He cites a note that suggests providing theme music for, quote-unquote, the baddies, but the note explicitly names the, quote-unquote, baddies, and none of them is Colburn. Docket 286, Exhibit 9. Uh, similarly, the note Colburn cites that suggests using, quote-unquote, bad guy theme music in a specific scene names four people in that scene and again Colburn is not one of them. The suggestion from the entire entirely different set of notes that the documentary should have quote unquote thriller atmospheric score does not refer to Colburn and says nothing about the truth or fals falsity. You want to read None that? Of this but you you want to read that? Um, but no, for you continue. Yeah. But no. Yeah. Uh, Colburn's new contention that comments by Glenn imply a wide-ranging law enforcement conspiracy is not only several steps removed from the alleged implication that Colburn planted evidence against Avery years later. It is a dramatic departure from the Sachs focus on the notion that Glenn falsely stated that Colburn's 2003 report about the call had been kept in the sheriff's safe. As Netflix noted it, in its own summary judgment papers, Colburn has now admitted that he knew all along that his report was kept in the sheriff's safe because the sheriff told Colburn that's where he put it. Wow. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> None of this has anything whatsoever to do with the actual malice as a matter of common sense, which we know none of the people in this fucking case has ever had, in Wisconsin law, music does not ass ass assertions of a vi verifiable fact or render true statements false. Television reports use use of scary music was not a statement of fact. Colburn says that another note shows, quote unquote, defendants were actively looking for opportunities to use source material in such a way to, quote, allude to the fact that cops may have planted something, unquote. MPSJ at 13. That document, a page of notes, from a larger two, 2014 memo regarding episodes one through four actually states, quote, is there anything we can use or show to clarify whether or not the cops had a warrant to search his property and allude to the fact that they may have planted something when they were there without permission, unquote. This note shows the opposite of actual malice. Here again, a Netflix employee was referring to Avery's allegation at trial of evidence planting. The Netflix employee sought additional fact information to clarify views, viewers whether the, the searchers that Avery contended were tainted had been conducted under a lawful warrant. In stating that officers, quote, may have planted something, unquote, this note does not draw any conclusion as to whether that defence was factual or not. 
just like MAM itself, does not draw any such conclusion. Colburn also points out that Netflix, quote, endorsed using Avery's father's statement. They framed an innocent man just like they did 20 years ago, unquote, as a significant cliffhanger. To episode two, MPSJ at 13. Whether a statement should serve as a cliffhanger is not legally significant. Regardless, in the final version of MAM, that statement is not used as a cliffhanger at the end of episode two or any other episode. Alan Avery's quote is included at 1349 to 1404 of episode three. Not only does this note fail to show any knowledge of falsity, it also illustrates that Netflix notes were merely suggestions that did not necessarily result in any changes to the finished series, Docket 27. The MPSJ also refers to notes that Colburn says show a desire to portray Avery in a positive light, MPSJ 14. They are irrelevant to the issue of actual malice because they are not about Colburn and thus cannot indicate anything about whether anyone knew or suspected anything about Colburn was false. Finally, the motion refers to an email from filmmakers Moira Demos that was not sent to any member of the Netflix team responsible for MAM about images used in the quote-unquote trailer advertisement of, for the series, MPSJ 14. The, the trailer is not an issue in this case. Colburn has never mentioned it in any of his pleadings and does not include it in his 52 challenge statements. This email has no probative, probative value here and has nothing to do with the truth or falsity in any event. The MPSJ simply does not identify any evidence in the record of which a reasonable jury could find that Netflix distributed MAM with knowledge or awareness that it contained falsehoods about Colburn, much less by clear and convincing evidence. <laughs> and number four, if accepted, Colburn's argument would upend more than a century of settled defamation law. Colburn's fundamental misrepresentations about the First Amendment and defamation law are so jarring it is worth reflecting on what it would mean to accept them. Under Colburn's theory, because he denied planting evidence during his trial testimony and because the jury convicted Avery, that's the end of the story. The verdict vindicated him and marked the moment or moment the public was no longer permitted to debate Avery's guilt, law enforcement's conduct, or the possibility that a miscarriage of justice had occurred. In other words, under Colburn's theory, Mam could not be safely released to the public unless and until post conviction conviction appellate attorney Kathleen Zellner actually succeeds in exonerating him. It would mean that no one could safely have debated whether Avery was wrongfully convicted in 1985 or accused the public officials involved in that conviction of the misconduct or incompetence until Avery's exoneration. But of course, documentaries consider issues like this all the time without concern for liability. As one example, consider the Serial podcast, which highlighted questions and inconsistencies in the conviction of Adnan Saeed. That podcast was released while Saeed sat in prison for a 1999 killing and questions about the verdict the podcast explored resulted in Saeed's vacated conviction in September at the prosecution's request for law enforcement and prosecutorial misconduct. And then it says, prosecutors recently dropped all charges against Saeed, declining to retry him. Um, under Colburn's theory, however, 
publication of the podcast prior to Saeed's release would have been false and defamatory, leading to the absurd result that no publisher could, without fear of liability, uncover and report on potential miscarriages of justice when such investigative reporting matters must, while most, sorry, matters most, while a defendant sits in prison deprived of his liberty. <clears throat> Closer to home, it would mean that because Kyle Rittenhouse was acquitted, publications of photos like this, which merely re reflect one side of a raging debate on a matter of in intense public interest and concern, are somehow defamatory. This not be the law. Unfortunately, it is not due to the overlapping common law and constitutional do doctrines discussed above. As the Seventh Circuit observed recently, the Wisconsin Supreme Court has long recognised the value to the legal system of reports about controversial cases, holding that the public needs to know what is for Sorry, I'll do that again. The public needs to know what its court does, and since this cannot be intelligibly reported without stating the charges and issues upon which the court's actions is based, the latter may be reported also. Although, as an incidental result, the fact of defamatory charges against some individuals becomes public to his injury. <clears throat> Colburn, in essence, asks this court to write more than a century of Wisconsin's defamation law to prohibit public discussion of allegations made by the losing side in a contested court proceeding. The public would be the loser should he prevail. Conclusion For all of the foregoing reasons, Netflix respectfully requests that this court deny plaintiff's motion for partial summary judgment, dated November 4th, 2022, signed by Lita Walker. The superwoman. That was Lita fantastic. Walker. Oh my God. I... And they did it in 20 pages. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely destroyed everything. And it can't stand. <laughs> She's right. It cannot stand. There's just absolutely no way. Uh, okay, before we continue, let's take a look here, quick look here at the, at the chat to see if there's any questions or comments. Whatever. I'll go ahead Colburn's and flip. Colburn's going to lose. <laughs> <laughs> Catnet says, do you think other filmmakers, platform holders, etc., are following this case and or have possibly re-edited a segment in their documentary as a just in case, nah. no, mm -mm. Uh, I don't. It's a good question. No, there's there's no meat on the bones. If there was some meat on the bones, maybe, but there's none. Read, read Dr. Sutton's comment. If Colburn wins this civil suit, that likely will put an end to true crime documentaries, including convicting as the producers can be potentially sued <laughs> as well. Yeah. Well, not yeah. not only not only true crime, there are other um uh other genres where, you know, there are uh, subjects are explored, not necessarily presenting um uh, something as truth, but as presenting as information, which is what Nam did. Uh they also stand a potential of, of being sued for something, you know, if this were to stand. Yeah, forget forget just documentaries. Twenty twenty, um, Dateline. Yeah, right. forty eight hours. All those shows would be done. Done. Yeah. Sixty minutes. Done. Yeah, there's just absolutely no. Yeah, absolutely no way. Um, okay. Talk this about a narcissist. I mean, he makes everything about him, doesn't he? Absolutely. In man. <laughs> Jesus. 
Oh, oh yeah, catnip. Uh, that catnip. I just uh, the precedent would be uh, well. That's that's why we you know we we call this a a landmark case. Uh, in my opinion, it is. It will. Not, I don't think it could ever pass. But uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, has the potential for a landmark case. What was it that Leda said it'll overturn hundreds of years of precedent? A uh, uh, hundred years, <laughs> century. Yeah, a century of yeah. Mm, not gonna happen. Colby's gonna lose. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, th this next uh, thing that's up, this next document, is uh, an appendix, and it's noted, it was noted uh, in that last document we read, it's an appendix, and uh, best, I, I did take a glance at this, and it, it looks like it's plaintiff's um, proposal fact number three, and it's got a number, and it's got MAM episode and time and then the reason's not actionable, besides no evidence of actual malice. Every I think this maybe does this go through all fifty-two of his points, or yeah, I, I think it goes through. Yeah, I think it does. Actually, it probably does. I, I like I said, I haven't read it, read it all, but you know, they, oh, we're not going to read through all these. But uh, no, she they did detail. She did go through and detail it for just love. Yeah, and then you know she a lot of these she puts down here at the bottom, um, to the extent that this statement can be. Uh, read to imply Coburn had a motive to plant evidence that is true as found by Judge Patrick Willis. And she has yeah. all this stuff. Yeah. So we'll make uh, we'll make all these documents available uh, after we're done. Um, of course, I, I'll link them. They're, they're actually in the library. I think Zoe already has these in the library, uh, actually. So I'll get them linked. So if anybody wants to take a look at this, uh, you know, they're more than welcome to do so. But it, it basically details in a more expanded form of what she did said concisely in that prior document. So that's what this. Is. I like that footnote number one there. He just passed over it. Uh, in an no, abundance of, yeah. yeah. In an abundance of caution and consistent with LR 56 B eight Netflix has kept the combined page count of its brief and its appendix to 30 pages. For the court's convenience, a longer appendix that includes each of the 52 statements for embellishments that Coburn puts in his issue is attached as Exhibit 2 to the second Walker Declaration. <laughs> <laughs> she, doesn't miss a, she doesn't miss a beat. She doesn't yeah. miss anything. That, that's why I said uh, she's... Um, I don't know. I, I would just like to see a mind like hers working on uh, Avery and Dassey's cases. I, I just think she would catch things that others and put it together in a way that others uh, just haven't done. Anyway, so yeah. Yeah. let's move on here. This is uh, this is a thirty-one page <laughs> document. And this is a de defendant Net Netflix Inc.'s response to Plaintiff Andrew Coburn's proposed findings of fact and Netflix additional proposed findings of fact. Uh, let me give me just one second. I'm going to blow this up just a little bit. Clear some of this up a little. Uh, That's a little bit bigger. Okay. Uh, since this is about a uh, about a thirty page document, I'll uh, let's see who we got here. If I can pick on that. He's he's up for grabs. Well, we have. Uh, well, we have me. I'll start off, and then uh, as we go, and maybe we'll break off, and so it's not just me reading. So let's get to this one. And uh, just for reference, this is document 309. All righty. I defend, um, pursuant to civil local rule 56B2B, defendant Netflix, Inc., and Netflix, and through its undersigned counsel for its response to plaintiff Andrew Coburn's proposed findings of fact, and Netflix's additional proposed finding of fact states as follows. General objections. 
The vast majority of Plaintiff Andrew Coburn's 78 proposed findings of fact are challenged, quote-unquote, statements from making a murder, ma'am, 52 in all, that he contends taken, quote-unquote, individually or collectively imply or insinuate that, one, Steve Nabry was wrongly convicted of the murder of Teresa Halbach, two, that Manitowoc County law enforcement officers framed a for Halbach's murder, and three, that Coburn was a key participant in that conspiracy to frame a All the statements have been removed from their broader context. Many of them have nothing at all to do with the investigation of Halbach's murder or Avery's allegations that Coburn planted evidence to frame him. Frame him. In that sense, there. In that sense, they are wholly immaterial to Coburn's implied libel theory. In any event, Coburn does not actually ask the court to find that any of the 52 statements standing alone is materially false or defamatory, much less cite evidence that would support such a finding. In fact, many of the statements are not about him, do not constitute verifiable statements of fact, and or substantially true. Others do nothing more than than repeat allegations made in open court, rather than the burden rather than burden the court with long, lengthy, repetitive responses to each uh, enumerated statement. Netflix here explains the various and over overlapping reasons the statements are not actionable and are otherwise immaterial for court. partial motion for summary judgment and his. Newfound implied libel. One, first, in both the post facts and his motions for partial summary judgment, Coburn fails to analyze the challenged statements in the context of the whole documentary series as required under law. Case law there, uh, the documentary speaks for itself. The court must review the challenged statements in, in the context of the entire 10 hour series and Netflix objects to Colburn's descriptions and characterizations of the content of Two. Second, Colburn fails to explain the materiality of any of the challenge statements he enumerates as proposed facts. A fact is material only if, quote, might affect the outcome of the suit under the governing law, end quote. 48 of the 52 statements Coburn challenges are so subsidiary or peripheral to the claims that Auburn did not even bother to mention them in the body of the Second Amendment complaint, SAC, relating, relegating them instead to exhibit and failing to even now to explain how they are false or defamatory, despite his burden to do. What's more, proposed facts numbers 3 through 29 and 38 cannot be reasonably interpreted as accusing Coburn of planning evidence in the Hallbach case or otherwise defaming him because they are exclusively about the quote unquote jail call he received in and around 1995, the misconduct surrounding Avery's wrongful conviction in 1985, and Avery's post conviction civil rights law. At most, these statements. These statements imply Colburn may have been motivated to plant evidence and ensure Avery's conviction, but that implication is substantially true. In the run-up to Avery's trial, the Honorable Judge Patrick Willis found that Colburn had such a motive. See docket 271.14. Accordingly, Netflix disputes the materiality of the 52 channel statements, in particular those not properly pled, not, not properly pleaded in the SAC and those that on their face, have nothing to do with Coburn's implied libel. Three. Third, although a defamation plaintiff can only recover for recover for statements that are of and convincing of him, case law, Coburn has challenged many of the statements that are clearly about individuals other than him, and he does not explain how these statements purport to defame him. For example, Proposed fact number three is a stipu- is a quotation of Avery that, quote, they had the evidence back then that I didn't do it, that nobody said anything, end quote. The surrounding context 
makes it clear that Avery is talking about law enforcement involved in investigating and convicting him for the 1985 rape of Penny Bernstein. This statement cannot possibly be about Coburn because he did not work for the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office at the time Avery was wrongfully convicted of rape. See SAC 9. The first fact and others like it are not material. Fourth, or four. Fourth, Colbert disregards that only statements of verifiable fact and not opinion or hyperbole can be false. Further, quote, it is plain that the speaker is expressing a subjective view, an interpretation, a theory, conjecture, or surmise rather than claiming to be in possession of objectively verifiable facts. The statement is not actionable, in quote, in more cases. Post fact number 49, which Coer mistakenly truncates, are not actionable for this reason. This proposed fact and others like it are not material. Five. Fifth, to the extent that any of the 52 challenge statements can be considered as a verifiable statement of fact, Coburn has not presented any evidence that any portion of the statements are materially false, a burden which it is entirely his. Okay. To the contrary, a substantial, a substantial majority of the statements are disturbingly and substantially true. By the way of example, in proposed fact number 12, Colburn puts at issue a graphic including an episode two of Ma'am, which depicts the a, that in 1995 Gregory Allen is arrested for assault in Brown County. Andrew Colburn receives a call about the an inmate confession. Every component of that statement is true. In 1995, Allen was in custody in Brown County. At around that time, Colburn received a call about an inmate confession, and Allen and not Avery, Ray Bernstein. Other examples abound, and none of these are proposed facts or material. Six, finally, and as separate and apart from the 52 challenge statements, Colburn contends in proposed facts numbers 62 through 69 that he received voicemail messages from anonymous callers, but he fails to explain their relevance or materiality in either his proposed findings of fact or his summary judgment of briefing. In fact, they are completely immaterial. They cannot impact the outcome of his motion. Moreover, these proposed facts are inadmissible in a defamation action as Colburn has made no effort to authenticate the recordings, which are relevant and hearsay, at least to the extent offered to the proof of the, what callers said regarding their opinions of Colbert. Courts across the country have soundly rejected litigants' attempts to prove defamation by relying on anonymous comments. There's a footnote. Footnote defendants, uh, number one, defendants uh, published 10 part series making murder Netflix. Okay, there's just some case law there. Netflix response, undisputed, as parties have already stipulated to this fact. Looks like we've got some more footnotes. We'll get to them here in a moment. Uh, further, as Colbert himself conceded at his deposition, any individuals who called him and left anonymous, anonymous voicemails are not representative of the reasonable viewer, and many may not have even watched them. He does not know unless they express, expressly said so in their voicemail message. Uh, Netflix accordingly disputes each and every one of these proposed facts and objects to the court's consideration there. Uh, we read number one, number two footnote. The following statements made by the identified individuals are contained in MAM where, or approximately were indicated together with graphics, images, and video as described below. That's the declaration from Matthew Kelly previously filed in this action. Netflix response, undisputed, that certain individuals are quoted in MAM at or around the indicated timestamps. Three, Stephen Avery goes over, quote, they had, they had the evidence back then that I didn't do it, that nobody did anything, end quote. That's episode one, gives the time. Netflix response, undisputed, that this quotation of Avery is included at or, at or around the indicated timestamp. 
And then number four, we read this earlier, Kim DeCott, uh, Avery, Avery Relative, states on camera, quote, they, they weren't just going to let Stevie out. They weren't just going to hand him, that man, $36 million. They weren't going to be made a laughingstock, that's for sure. They just weren't going to do that or do all that. And something in my gut said they're not done with him. Something's going to happen. They're not handing that kind of money over to Stephen Avery, end quote. And that's at episode one. It gets the time. Netflix, Netflix response. Undisputed that this quotation of Kim Nicot is included at or around the indicated timestamp. Number five, photos of plaintiff and others are shown during the Kim Nicot statement. Netflix response. Disputed that this state, that this is a statement. Undisputed that ma'am shows a video clip without audio of Coburn's deposition in a civil lawsuit against Manitowoc County at or around the indicated timestamp. Number six, Steve Glenn identified as Avery's counsel in the civil law uh, case against Manitowoc County states, quote, the day or on the day after Stephen's release, law enforcement officers in Manitowoc are writing memos to describe activity that had occurred almost 10 years earlier. They don't do that unless they feel threatened. End quote. Episode two gives the Netflix response disputed. Quotation of Glenn is not included in episode two. It is included in episode one. Uh, and it gives a gun statement, gives a time and, and so forth. Number seven, Steve Glenn they state. They can't uh, even get the timestamp right for fuck's yeah, sake. Yeah, that's pretty fucking bad. I, I got to tell you. Episode. Can't get the ep- <laughs> Bad. It's Damn. so bad. Yeah. Uh, number, oh, <laughs> number seven. Steve Glenn states, quote, we learned in litigation something that we had absolutely no knowledge of before the lawsuit got started. But the 1995, that 1995 was a very, very significant point in this thing, end quote. Gives it the, the episode and the time. Netflix response undisputed that this quotation of Glenn was included at or around the uh, indicated time stamp. Uh, number eight, video deposition of Mr. Colburn is shown in the background with Steve Glenn voiceover, image of Mr. Colburn. Netflix response is disputed that this statement, that this is a statement. Undisputed that ma'am shows a video clip without audio of Colburn's deposition in Avery's civil lawsuit against Manitowoc County at or around the indicated time. Number nine, Steve Glenn continues, quote, and that there's not only something to this idea that law enforcement had information about somebody else, but there is serious meat on those bones. I mean serious meat. All we learn is that while Stephen Glenn, I mean, while Stephen Avery is sitting in prison now for a decade, a telephone call comes into the Manitowoc, Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department. Image of Mr. Colburn's report is shown in the back. From another law enforcement agency saying that they had someone in custody who said they had committed an assault in Manitowoc and an assault for which somebody was currently in prison, end quote. And it gives the episode and the time. Netflix response, undisputed that this quotation of Glenn is included at or around the indicated time. Number 10, video footage of Mr. Colburn's testimony in the civil case is in response to the questioning of Glenn. Netflix response undisputed that ma'am shows a video clip of Colburn's deposition in every civil lawsuit against Manitowoc County at around the indicated time. Number 11. Steve Glenn continues, quote, Manitowoc doesn't have a huge numbers of major assaults where people go to prison and certainly where people would still be in prison. This, there is a very distinct possibility, and I'd say likelihood, that, that it's Gregory Allen it's the Brown County Sheriff's Department that in that is in 1995 on the Gregory Allen case that Gregory Allen has said something about Stephen Avery, and at, at and at minimum somebody might ought to check this out. End quote. Uh, episode two gives the timestamp. Netflix, Netflix response undisputed that this quotation of Glenn is included at or around the indicated timestamp. And number twelve. I like I like how they put after all these 
general objection numbers one, two, four, and five. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. They've included yeah. it on every damn one of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Number 12, graphic, uh, graphic showing uh, during the cutaway from Glenn's interview while Glenn is still speaking shows, quote, 1995, Gregory Allen is arrested for assault in Brown County. Andrew Colburn receives a call about inmate confession, end quote. Episode two gets the timestamp. Netflix response, undisputed that ma'am includes a graphic at or around the indicated timestamp. And, of course, yeah, the general object. Number 13, cuts to video of Mr. Colburn's deposition testimony in a civil case with the following exchange. Glenn, quote, I mean, that's a significant event. Mr. Colburn, right, that's what... But that's what stood out in my mind. In, and that's it. Episode two gets the time. The Netflix response undisputed that ma'am shows a video clip of Colburn's deposition in Avery's lawsuit against Manitowoc County at around the indicated timestamp. Uh, number 14 returns to the interview with Glenn, who says, quote, the fellow who got that call was a guy named Colburn. And you might say that there should be a record of him immediately making a report of this. There might be a record of his immediately contacting the supervising officer. There might be a record of him contacting a detective who handles assault cases. Ah, there might be some record of it. But if you thought of any of those things, you'd be wrong. Because there aren't any record in 95 and goes all the way up through so forth. And it gives the episode and the uh, time. Netflix response, undisputed that this quotation of Glenn is included at around the time stamp, indicated timestamp. 15. Visual cuts to graphic with years running from a timeline image with Mr. Colburn's photograph above it. And a statement after the year 2003 that states DNA evidence exonerates Stephen Avery. Netflix response, Disputed that this graphic appears at the indicated timestamp. It appears from. <laughs> I got this one wrong too. <laughs> um, and it gives the time there. Disputed that Colburn's photograph is the only is only one in the graphic. Other individuals are are pictured. I remember that. Uh, Sixteen. Glenn continues. Quote. Now, two thousand three is a year that has meaning because. That's when Stephen Avery got out. And the day he got out, on the, or the day after, that's when Coburn decides to contact his superior officer named Link. And Link tells him to write a report. And they go to have contact with the sheriff. Now, let's just stop and think about that for a minute. Why does that happen? Why does it happen then when it didn't happen eight years earlier? Uh, mm, uh, I mean, I think I know the answer. I think the answer is pretty clear that these people realized they had screwed up big time. Colburn realized it. Link, at, as his superior, realized it. And the sheriff realized it, end quote. Episode 2 gives the timestamp. Netflix response undisputed that this quotation of Glenn is included at or around the indicated time. Number 17. Images of Colburn, James Link, and the sheriff are shown. Is the... Episode in time. Netflix response disputed that this is a statement and disputed that Ma- ma'am shows a video clip without audio of Coburn's deposition and Avery's civil lawsuit against Manitowoc County at around the indicated timestamp. And I'm going to take it for granted. I'm going to stop. I'm going to pause it right here. I'm going to take it for granted that the rest of these are um, more of the same. I, I don't know that we yeah. need to read. I don't know that we need to read them all. I've read close to 20. Yeah, it's a- it's all of, you know, Colburn's 52 points that he's pointing out. It's like, I, it, it's, yeah. there's, there's nothing there. There, there, there. And some of them they even fucked know, up. They, some of them they even fucked up and got the wrong episode and timestamp. Oh, that's bad. It's <laughs> terrible. Yeah. Yeah, there's 52 of them, so. Okay. Well, yeah. I'm not going to. I don't think it's necessary to go through them. I think we all know, you know, gonna, what I'm, he's. Yeah. Claiming it's just totally ridiculous. He's got fifty-two points of nonsense. Yeah, exactly. Actually, actually it's goes it's more than fifty. Well, yeah, it does go beyond that. Uh, Seventy, seventy-eight. Something about 
78. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what separates the 52. and I'm not sure, but. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm making sure. Yeah. 78. So moving past all those. And to finish the document, because we're at. I think maybe the 52 are about the, the 10 episodes. And then what's beyond that is maybe about the notes between Netflix and the girls. Maybe. I think that's I think that's right. I think that's. Right. Yeah. OK, so we're going to uh, go to the uh, Netflix is additional proposed. This is at the bottom, more towards the bottom of the doc. So, so we can finish this one out because I don't want to leave it out. Um, Netflix's additional proposed, fact, uh, proposed findings of fact. Number one, Mayhem used graphical elements to enhance the clarity and factual action of the series for viewers, especially because Avery's story spanned several decades and involved key players. In episode two, one such graphic, which included the photographs of several individuals, including Colburn, Link, and Peterson, was used to orient viewers. Two, immediately following the partial quotation of Avery's counsel, viewing reference in Coburn's proposed number fact number 42, episode 4, also includes viewing state. So we looked around at one guy's name, and he just kept coming up over and over and over, every place we looked, at critical moments, and that was Lieutenant James Link. Link is the guy who finds the key in the bedroom on the seventh entry at a supposedly in plain view. Link is deposed just three weeks before the Hallbach disappearance. And then, most peculiar, peculiar of all, is when we looked into Stephen's old 1985 case file in the clerk's office. Some items from that court file ultimately proved to exonerate Stephen. Interestingly enough, the transmittal form that goes with the evidence in 2002 at the crime lab is filled out by none other at that time than Detective Sergeant James Lynch. And it gives the episode in the time. Number three. Episode seven includes a scene in which Avery's attorneys, Strang and Beauty, are strategizing over a theory of, of the defense and preparing for forthcoming witness examinations at the Avery criminal trial for the murder of Hall. After a lengthy exchange in the Coburn's proposed facts, number 50, Strang states, quote, yeah, I'll, I'll connect that, end quote. Referring to the line of cross-examination string we're pursuing. Uh, the rest of the episode uh, shows a series of cross-examinations. Number four, the note from Netflix creative team about quote-unquote bad guy theme music from which Cloburn selectively quotes in proposed, proposed fact number 73 reads in full. Quote 42, I guess that's 42 minutes, learning that Tom Fassbender is calling Scott Taddeck to convince Barbara to make Brendan take a plea. Perfect moment for a bad guy theme, end quote. It makes no mention or implication toward Coburn. Number five. <laughs> 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 I knew you'd laugh at that. I knew you would. <laughs> I, I was laughing internally. I was like, oh, my God. How can you not laugh at this whole case? I know. No kidding. Uh, oh, God. Bad guy music. Yeah, Ooh. about and it was not even about Colburn. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, oh, number five, the note from Netflix creative team from which Colburn selectively quotes in proposed fact number 74 reads in full, quote, 2123, is there anything we can use show to clarify whether or not the cops had a warrant to search the pro search's property and allude to the fact that they may have planted something when they were without permission? In quote. Number six, the email from filmmaker Maura Demos regarding the transfer, I'm sorry, regarding the trailer for MAM reference in Coburn's proposed fact number 78 was not sent by any of the members of the Netflix creative team who worked on the production of MAM. Lisa Nishimura, Adam Dedelka, Del Dio, Ben Kotner, or Marion Javid, Javidi, though. Javadi, through whom Colbert must prove factual miles by clear and convincing evidence. See docket 286. Number seven, as his deposition in this case, Colbert testified that 
to accept his denial at Avery's murder trial that he planted evidence. Quote, you would have to trust that I was telling truth under <laughs> oath. End <laughs> quote. But that, quote, I like to think that my testimony, and <laughs> when I say something, people understand that I'm under oath and I'm saying the truth, end quote. <laughs> the second, second declaration of <laughs> Number eight, in response oh, to a question about whether he could understand how someone who wasn't there when he searched Avery's property might have something, uh, some uncertainty about it, his explanation of how he and others found the evidence that led to Avery's conviction for Hallmark's murder, Colburn testified that, quote, I don't have an in instinctive distrust of law enforcement, end quote. This is from November 4th, 2022. Lido. Wow. Holy shit. Okay. So let me turn that off for a moment. Under your scars wants to know, when is this going forward? Do we know when they're supposed to have a decision for this? Not a clue. Not a clue. The judge now has to go through all this stuff. So I, I would guess it'd be a while. Try to keep it short, 78 points later. Right. <laughs> I think this whole lawsuit's done in malice. There's definitely, uh, Lita's been uh, pointed and there's just, she just has no. Okay. No, especially when he's pointing out points or so called points that doesn't even include him. You know what I mean? It's like this should have got flung out. Well, Judge Ludwig should have taken one look at it and went, Are you having a laugh, mate? Fuck off. I think it's great that they keep pointing out that he has to prove, he has that burden of proof to prove that he didn't plant anything and he hasn't. Because <laughs> he can't. Well, come on, Jinx. When he yeah. testified on the stand, yeah. that, that was the that proves thing. it. Yeah. How she put that, his selective denial, how did she say it? Is his, his, uh, Denial, <laughs> self righteous denial, or whatever. Self righteous, yeah. Uh, uh, that is his only answer to that. I mean, come on. Because I said so. <laughs> exactly. Hey, I'm a cop. I don't lie. Yeah, when I get on the stand, I expect people to know that I'm telling the truth by God. Okay, so Sadly, though, that's how a lot of juries see things. They see this cop on the stand and they can't believe that they would actually lie in testimony. And, and what did they call it? Testalize. <laughs> 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 so there you have it. Cops lie. They're people, too. They're human also can be persuaded, paid. You know, there's all kinds yeah. of reasons to lie. Yeah, well, Ali Softball Life has joined us in chat. Welcome, Ali. They said, Stephen said he didn't kill Teresa. So if Colbert's saying, I didn't plant evidence, is enough, then why isn't Stephen's words enough as well? Well, That's come on. Very man. good point. It is a good point. Yeah, it definitely is. Just because uh, but, uh, Stephen says he didn't do it, then he didn't do it. Because Colburn says he didn't plant any evidence, so he didn't do it. What a load of bollocks. But Stephen's not a cop. And he is. He's got a badge, so that makes him special. Well, they had badges all up in the office, so, I mean, he could have been a cop. I saw, <laughs> I saw a bunch of those spike fucking badges. Come on. I'm surprised they didn't use that as uh, him pulling her over and pretending like he was a cop. <laughs> well, I'm I'm going to be mean here for just a second, but I could see Chuck doing that, putting the blue light and you know yeah. on the dash. But right, you know, I mean, you know, there are other cases we've seen that happen. I'm not saying he I'm did sure. that. 
I'm, I'm just, pretty sure that has happened in other cases. Where they oh, I, I'll, uh, oh, yeah, the uh, the thin blue line. Absolutely, it did. Other cases too. Okay. Um, any other comments that you can see? Uh, I say I see Kelly McAllen is joining us. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Oh, hey, joining us. Emma Williams joined us. That's hey. McAlian. Jack. Under your scars is joined us. Oh, McAlian, I missed that. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's right. What a cool. What yeah. a cool. Kuwait joined us. Jasna has joined us. Um, <laughs> and I think that's that's us. Oh, sorry if I missed anybody. That's all right. Uh, Ali Softball, as I say, Oh, All right. Anthony D has just joined us. Hi, oh. Anthony. Welcome. Hi. Okay, uh, moving on. I'll pull up a few more documents, and I will tell you that uh, we have uh, excerpts, more excerpts that we didn't have before of uh, Coburn's deposition that's coming. So, but first, we have a couple, a two-page document here. Uh, Lita Walker. This is the second declaration. And uh, Alice, you want to read this? Declaration of Lita Walker. I, Mary Andrew Lita, Lita Walker, under penalty of perjury and subject to 28 USC, declares as follows. Number one, I am a partner at Bollard and Spa, LLP in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and lead counsel for defendant Netflix Inc. In the above reference matter, I have personal knowledge of the matter set forth herein, and I make this declaration in support of Netflix's opposition to plaintiff's motion for partial summary judgment. Number two, attached here to as exhibit one is a true and correct copy of excerpts of the transcripts of the deposition of plaintiff Andrew Colburn in this matter. Number three, attached here to as exhibit two is a complete version of the appendix to defendant Netflix Inc's opposition to plaintiff's motion for partial summary judgment, which includes a column listing verbatim each of the 52 statements or embellishments that Colburn puts in issue as part of his MPSJ. I declare under per penalty of perjury that the foregoing is true and correct. Dated November 4th, 2022, signed Lita Walker. There you go. And I don't know, somehow I've missed it. She's, they're located in Minneapolis, huh? Wow, they're just right there. All righty. All right, let's see what we got here. This is exhibit one. Let me fix this. So. Okay, yeah, July 21st, 2022. I think we might have Sapper for just a little bit longer. I think you needed two people for this. Uh, yep. Uh, yeah, we definitely need a couple people at least. I don't know if there's any other objections about outside, but we definitely need a lawyer and uh, somebody to play cold. And it gives, of course, it gives the law firms here on the... I'm not going to read all of them, but uh, on behalf of the plaintiff, and there's April Rockstead on behalf of the plaintiff, uh, Ballard and Spar on behalf of Netflix, the defendant, um, several more lawyers. And then, of course, uh, the lawyers on behalf of uh, Riccardi and, and Demon. And then also the present, it uh, looks, oh, looks like, um, okay. So we've got more in D, uh, Demos and Riccardi that attended. And uh, somebody from Netflix litigation also attended. Interesting. A whole bunch of lawyers in that room. Oh, pile of lawyers. Yeah. Um, 
Zapper, are you here? Are you able to read some more or do you need to take off here soon? I think he's gone. Oh, okay. Alrighty. Uh, well, uh, Alice, I can I can play the lawyer and you can play Netflix or uh, Coburn if you like. Does that work out for you? Yep. 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 All right. All right. I'm going to start on page one here. Uh, and I'm going to just guess here without having gone through and looked at each page. I'm going to guess this jumps around. So don't kill us. That's just the way we got it. So. Yeah, well, it's just excerpt. Yeah, it's just yes. excerpt. So, so I'll, I'll try. I'll try to make a note of it when we get to the bottom of the page. If I see it doesn't continue, that we had started, you know, wherever they're at again, and what they're pointing out. So, alrighty, line one. Um, yes, oh, that's I you. Do. That yeah, that's you. Yep. Yeah, yes, I do. Okay. Um, question. But unless Mister Greasebach was in the room with you, or any of us sitting here today were in the room with you. None of us can know with 100% certainty, correct? I think that I drove that point home in the trial, and based on the subsequent conviction, I believe the jury was convinced of it. We would have to trust you, correct, Mr. Colburn? Yes, you would have to trust that I was telling the truth under oath. And the jury found for the prosecution and convicted Mr. Avery, correct? Yes, they did. And the jury's findings were included in making a murder, correct? Well, we do Objection have Objection form. Do you know? I have not watched a clip of any of or any of making a murderer when the jury verdict is read or so I can't answer you positively. I don't know what was included. I don't know what episode that was in. Uh, you would, um, I'm not sure this is going to continue. It looked like it doesn't. You would have no reason to dispute that it was included, correct? Duh. The certification page. Uh, I'm not, this is some kind of notary stamp. I'm not exactly sure why they included Okay, so here we go with, here we go with more. Uh, exam July, this is the 22nd, the following day, 902 to 440. Bunch of lawyers in the room, and it looks like the same people that were present the day before. Alrighty, uh, line one, Alice. Judy Hill. At any time. I believe Kathleen Zellner might have tried some sort of reenactment of it, but I haven't viewed the reenactment. Anyone from law enforcement side looking at some, something similar that you've heard of? No. Now, prior to that day, the key was discovered. You had previously searched the room, right? On previous day? Yes. Yes, sir. Hmm. And during searches on previous days, had you personally searched the bookcase? Yes. But you didn't find the key at that time? No. And nobody else did either, right? No. Does it surprise you that it wasn't found until that day on November 8th? I was surprised that we found it on the last day, yes. Can you understand how someone who wasn't there for the search like yourself, Lieutenant Link or Deputy Kaharski, can, can you understand how they might have some uncertainty uh, about your three's explanation about how the key came to be found that day? Mr. Burnett, objection, form and foundation. Instinctive distrust of law enforcement. I trust law enforcement because I was in it for 27 years. So I like to think that my testimony, and when I say something, people understand that I'm under oath and I'm saying the truth. 
If I don't know the answer to a question, I say, I don't know. But you can understand how people who didn't know you personally, I'm not saying that they not they necessarily think that you're lying, but how they could walk away from hearing the explanation of how the key was found and just say, quote, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what happened. In- Mr. Burnett, objection. Can you, can you understand that? Objection to Foreman Foundation. My explanation at trial was the only possible way I could think that that key could got to where and cut off. Yeah. To where it landed. And that's the end of that. And I wish we had more of that. That's uh, that's some interesting stuff because, you know, it clearly says just in this little excerpt, these couple of excerpts here, these pages, they had already searched that room. They had already searched that bookcase. And it searched wasn't there. Bookcase. Yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't there. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Okay, exhibit. Yoga for the Ageless says, can you understand how a lot of people think you are full of shit? <laughs> I think Andy should uh, produce the um, the alien that put it there. <laughs> <laughs> and this is all 52, I think. Yeah, it's 20 pages, so it looks, like, yeah, it looks like it's the same as we looked at before. Yeah, that's what they said. In the beginning. Yep. Exactly. Later said that was, yeah. And this is the end of it. So that's exactly what it is. So, okay. Mm-hmm. All righty. Well, that's the end of those. Or three documents. I'm sorry. Well, let's pull up um, just one second. You guys can talk amongst yourselves if you like. It's going to take me a moment. I think there's more deposition, if I recall correctly. I could be wrong. Could be later on. Madness that he thinks that he can... I mean, for somebody that's not watched any of mom, apart from maybe a, a one or two episodes, you know, um... And knowing about the reenactment, you know, they're, they're all full of shit. I guarantee you every single one of them has sat and watched it episode for, to episode, the whole 20 hours that they've sat and they've watched it. Oh, hell yes. Num- numerous times. Yeah. Hell yes. Uh, I will tell you guys that there were some documents that uh, Cherie couldn't get the other day. The skips from 310, well, those are the two exhibit or two attachments, 310-2 up to 313. So I'm going to pull up a few more here. Yeah, this is 313. And I'll grab a few more. I'm kind of having to look down here to see. If, yes, okay, that's what I thought. Three fifteen and three sixteen. Hi, Moz. Nice to see you. No, my internet was here. No, Moz. Not oh, if you're married to Moses. <laughs> I thought she. I thought, I thought, she, I, I, I thought she said nosy. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Hey, Mouse. I think there's attachments to these right here. So let me hold up. Some of these have attachments and some don't, so. I mean, it's true. How, how. I can't see how they're going to get past this summary judgment. I really, I really can't see how it can go any further, to be honest. This is an interesting attachment. Oh, lovely. 
guess I didn't look at this Kelly one. Kelly McKinley says, Can you understand, Andy? How people would wonder how you found a key after se several searches. A key with only Stephen's DNA in a place where you were not supposed to be. <laughs> Can you understand that, Andy? <laughs> Evidently not. Uh, yeah, I'm guessing that was Lita that was asking the questions. <laughs> I'm sure she was a, a beast at trial or at the deposition. Mm -hmm. Okay, this first document, a video exhibit of, okay. Um, video exhibit to declaration of Megan Finzel in support of the opposition to plaintiff's motion for partial summary judgment. Coburn v. Netflix. Honorable Judge Ludwig. Defendants Chrome uh, Synthesis Films LLC, uh, Riccardi, more most collectively, the producer defendants will submit an opposition to the plaintiff's motion to partial summary judgment with supplemental proposed findings of fact and supporting declaration of Megan Benzel. Enclosed, please find a USB drive containing the Exhibit 3 to the declaration of Megan Benzel, Part 2 of a three part video interview with Avery. Trial juror Rick Mahler, Mahler, Mayor, I'm sorry, by Mark Hottendot, published on YouTube on June 7, 2022, and gives the link. Produced by. It should say, should say Mahler. Yeah, that's yeah, a typo. Yeah, I thought so. I thought it was Mahler. Like, okay, I've been reading that shit wrong all these years. Huh. Produced by Netflix. This is interesting. And we discussed this a little bit, uh, you know, prior to uh, coming on live today. Let me highlight. This is the latest, this is the last one filed, correct? You went all the way to the bottom. No, this is 313 is not the last one filed. This is 313. I'm going in order. Hmm. That's spelled yeah. wrong. It's an L in his name. Yeah, yeah I that's know. What I said. Oh, okay. but, there's, but there's another document that's very similar to this, too. It's one of the last ones filed. I, I don't know. We'll, maybe we'll see later, uh, Susan. Yeah. Uh, but produced by Netflix. I, I don't understand. And, uh, you know, as a group, we were talking about prior on Discord and trying to understand that if anybody ha out there has any idea why Netflix, why, why this is included in this statement, I'd, I'd sure like to know. Why did Netflix produce Mark Hodnott's, um interview of Rick Mahler? Did they, did they send a list of questions potentially? Is that what we're, is that where, where this comes from? Maybe. I, I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, uh, it is. We could reach out and ask, uh, you know, Mark. Yeah. Uh, ask okay. Him. Get to Toffin. Come on. Come on, Jinxie. Get to Toffin. Tick, 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 tick. And ask him. <laughs> I don't, I mean, you know, I, I know of Mark, but I, I've only talked to him probably just a few times over the years. So, I don't really have a, a tight relationship with him, but uh, maybe somebody can, they, you know. They probably just That's thought he was the perfect him, person. I will ask him. <laughs> What's that, Susan? They probably just recognized him as a great person to do the interview and asked yeah, him but, to do it. Well, he is uh, also close with Mark. <coughs> he is uh, yes. friends with uh -huh. him. So it would be easy for Rick probably to talk to him also, right? Because yeah, because Rick did say, you know, I, a lot of people have wanted to interview me, and I didn't want to. So yeah. Well, you can't blame Rick the guy. Sure I asked him to come on foul play one day, but he he did not. So I'm glad he did something with Mark. Mm -hmm. Well, get it out there. Yeah, absolutely. Whether he does it with us or whoever, you know, as long as the information gets out there, that's what's really important. It was he such a good interview. I watched those over again, I think, yesterday, all three of them. It's really, really a good interview and really kind of tells the whole story. And yeah. it all comes down to jury intimidation in my book. In my I mind. definitely, I absolutely do think that uh, there was a jury uh, intimidation going on. There's no doubt. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, was was it, it was him that got the phone call about his uh, his daughter being in an accident or something like that? Yeah, and he also 
and he also confirms that Poggle showed up at one of their dinners after they'd gone to deliberation. Yeah. That's it, right. Yeah. yeah, because they wanted to have a few drinks after dinner, adult drinks, and instead of calling the jury uh, bailiff, Poggle says, no, I'll go down there myself. I'll take care of this, guys. <laughs> Yeah, what? Should have been a mistrial right there. Absolutely. He has no <laughs> business interaction with the jury. No business whatsoever. Uh, anyway, uh, to finish up, this exhibit is in response to plaintiff's motion, docket 284. This letter was filed at docket 313, as indicated by the CM uh, ECF stamp in the footer. The USB drive will be delivered by Federal Express on Monday, November 7, 2020. That's today. Megan Fizel, Jesse Bick, um, there it is there. So I don't, I don't know. I just found that statement interesting, but uh, maybe we'll find out more later. I asked him, so let's see what he says. He might not answer for a while, though. Um, I mean, we can reread this again. This is the declaration of Barbara Col Colbert. I, I don't know that we necessarily need to. Um, let me just, let me just look at something here. Just rock. Yeah, see that this, okay. This is new. 10, 10, 31, 20, or yeah, 10, 3. 20. Yes. Yes, it is new. So, so let's read this one. Crap. Sorry about that. All right. Um, Alice, you want to read this one? Yeah, Alice, you're no muted. Way. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Don't skin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Andrew L. Colburn, being first duly sworn on oath, deposes and says, Number one, my name is Brenda Barbara Colburn, and I am pre I previously was married to Andrew Colburn. Number two. I should say Barbara at the top. That's a uh, typo. We were first talk? duly sworn. That should oh, say Barbara Colburn. Not should say, that's, that's right. I, I, I saw that right yeah. Anyway, sorry. Do you think that was yep. it? Who wrote it then? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Oops. Here, will you sign this ex wife of mine? Yeah. <laughs> Number two, a divorce action was filed on March 10th, 2021, and the divorce was finalized on February 23rd, 2022. Number three, I received a subpoena from the Netflix defendants a copy of which is attached here too as Exhibit 1. Number four. On the Friday before the day of my subpoena, I received a call from attorney Lita Walker, who explained to me if I spoke to her over the phone that day, I didn't need to come on Monday. I felt like I had no choice but to talk to her as I had received the subpoena and it saved me from having to go in person on Monday. Lita Walker told me she was recording this call. To the best of my knowledge, no one else was present on that call. Number five. Lita Walker asked me if Andy acted differently after making a murderer was released, and I confirmed he did. I confirmed that maybe Andy was drinking more, but it was harder to quantify, and Andy did not overindulge in alcohol. Lita Walker seemed to be concentrating on his drinking, but I wanted to make sure to point out he did not overindulge and was not drunk. Number six, Andy did experience anxiety during, 2000, during the 2000... I will say it again, Alice. Andy did experience anxiety during the 2007 trial of Stephen Avery. But following the trial, 
and his anxiety reduced. Avery was found guilty, so the case was resolved. Number seven. Following the release of Making a Murderer, ma'am, Andy's anxiety increased, and it was much worse than it was during the trial. Andy never returned to normal after ma'am, and he was never able to let go of the defamation that he endured. It consumed him. Number eight. After ma'am, Andy was quieter, and he didn't want to go out and uh, out in public. He was suspicious of everyone. Whether they were thinking he was guilty or not, Andy felt that others thought he was somehow involved. Number nine. Andy always took his job as a law enforcement officer seriously and was offended about how Mam was portraying him. Number ten. Following the release of Mam, Andy received several threatening emails and voicemail messages. I had heard some of the voicemail messages and had seen some of the emails. We received mail from strange addresses and Andy had instructed me not to open any mail. Once we received exploding graffiti. Someone from Florida sent him popcorn and shark teeth. I'm sorry. <laughs> What the hell is that about? I have no idea. Popcorn and shark explode? teeth? I wonder if it exploded. Well, no, I think that was the graffiti. The, the popcorn yeah. and shark teeth, I don't... Um, was what he got. That was different, I think. Yeah, it was. But, what the hell? Number 11. Following the release of Making a Murderer, Andy would use a fake name when he was registering his car at a car show as he was afraid someone would vandalise his car if he used his real name. He attended maybe 10 car shows where he used a fake name. Number 12. Did she he just boarded... impersonating someone else? <laughs> like James Bond, maybe? Instead of... <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if he wore a wig. Licensed to kill. <laughs> Number 12. He boarded up the door at home as he felt I was at risk of getting attacked or robbed. This scared me. If a strange car was in the driveway, Andy became heightened. Whenever there would be a rally to free Stephen Avery in Manitowoc, Andy wanted me to be extra vigilant. This all occurs after the release of Making a Murderer. Number 13, Andy was worried about the children also and told the kids to be on the lookout whenever anything about Avery was in the news. 10-3-2022, signed Barbara Colburn. Wow. That's interesting. And I don't have I the test. Felt, I mean, her her yeah. original one was just too hurtful toward him, you know. They had to rebut. <laughs> I, I don't have their divorce. There's an attachment to the divorce ag agreement. Uh, that's not included here. Just to make a mention. I just want to say something really, really quick. Sure. And um, I don't know how well you can hear me, but him using another name is the same as a lie to me, which proves under special circumstances he might be willing to lie. Whatever. Well, that's oh, a good we point. We know he was willing to lie. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, yeah. actually. Yeah, but yeah. But they, he keeps admitting it over and over. I'm, I will lie. I will lie. I will have my wife lie. I will lie. I will have my life wife yeah. lie. I, I will definitely tell lies. So believe me when I tell you that I didn't plan evidence because I said so. <laughs> but when I'm on the stand, my God, I'm telling the truth. Yeah, and people should expect that when I'm on the stand, I'm telling the truth. Why did it? Why did you just say that? I don't lie when I'm talking. I'm, I'm telling the truth all the time, not just on the stand. A little submission of guilt. Yes, he said he lied to the doctor. People said he wasn't consciously you know. are admitting things, especially Colbert. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, this is a new, I just, that's why I scroll down to the bottom of this. This is a new declaration of grease block. So I, I'll read. I should have thought about the last one, but now I, I lost it. So if it comes back to me. Well, I'm... perhaps he lied to his wife as well. If he had a marital affair, I'm sure he didn't come home one day. Guess what, honey? Yeah, really. <laughs> Another good point. Yeah, he's saying he's going bowling, but he meant bowling. I'm just saying he had an affair, with, you know, and he, and she found out and she divorced his ass. So, right? Uh, uh, that goes into liar. well, that goes into telling the truth to your wife of many years, you know. So, right? Which record <clears throat> was it that you just read? Because I want to look it up real quick. Three fourteen. Thank you. Yep. All right. This is Greasebox new declar uh, declaration. Michael Griesbach, Michael C. Griesbach, during duly, first being duly sworn on oath, deposes and says, One, my name is Michael Griesbach. I am an attorney practicing in Manitoba County, and I was previously one of the attorneys representing Andrew Coburn in this act. Number two, in 2010, I self-published a book entitled Unreasonable Inferences Concerning the Stephen Avery Saga, focusing on his 1985 wrongful conviction. The book was republished by the American Bar Association in 2014 under the title Innocent Killer. Number three, I did send the email to Maura Demos and Laura Riccardi, docket 290-34, dated 12-13-2015, congratulating them on making a murderer. Number four, my comments in the email were in reference to the criminal injust justice system in general, not on Stephen on Avery's guilt or innocence, or his evidence planting the. Number five, I did send an email to my book agent on January 5, 2016, docket 289 30, shortly after watching Making a Murderer. I stated that I was convinced Avery was guilty, quote, but I am nowhere near as certain that the cops did not plant evidence to bolster their case, end quote. Number six. <laughs> little playing a little waffling there, are we? Trying to trying to explain away all this shit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Got the waffle got the waffle iron out. Uh, number six. In late January twenty sixteen, I entered into a contract with Kensington Publishing to write a second book concerning the Stephen Avery saga, this time focusing on the Hallbach murder investigation and the assertions made about about it in making a murderer. I began research for the book in February February 2016. My second book, Indefensible, was published and released in the fall of 2016. Number seven, prior to writing Indefensible in 2016, I had not thoroughly researched the Hallbach murder case and was not part of the investigation <laughs> or the prosecution of Stephen Avery and Brendan Dess. <laughs> Number eight. After comparing the assertions of making a murderer with police reports and trial transcripts, it became apparent that the series had badly misrepresented the facts. I publicly expressed my opinions concerning the falsehoods in various media interviews and an op-ed. Number nine, I was to some extent taken in by the falsehoods of making a murderer. The series strongly suggests that James Lincoln and Andy Colburn planted evidence to frame Mr. Avery. Upon conducting my research, my own research, it became abundantly clear that this assertion was false. Number I 10. I want to see that research. <laughs> attached as, a, as Show an me exhibit. That. Uh, exhibit one, or excerpt from my book, Indefensible, that clearly state my opinion of making a murderer. As stated in my book, quote, I thought, they, I, thought I knew that truth, but it was to some extent, fractured by making a murder. As I delved deeper into the circumstances surrounding Teresa Halbach's murder, the truth became whole again, end quote. Number 11. Uh, I have reviewed docket uh, 289-1 when I made the notation, quote, whitewash, end quote, on the document in 2010. I was referring to what I consider to be an, a failure of the Wisconsin Attorney General to hold accountable the then sheriff and the then DA. 
in her independent review of the Avery's 1985 wrongful conviction. My notation had nothing to do with the Hallbach murder investigation. Signed, Michael Griesbach, 11-3-2022. Wow. Interesting. Unbelievable. Mm. Jesus. I didn't mean what I said in that. It was blah, blah, blah. Oh, oh yeah. Right. This is what I, later. Yeah, this is what yeah. I meant here. Yeah. And, <laughs> and gets out another waffle iron, right? <laughs> but the fact that he even says there that his first book, he didn't do any research on it. You know what I mean? Then how the fuck are you writing a book about something that you've no fucking researched at all for? Not only did he yeah. not research that that part of the book, they used that book to do that show called Did He Do It? Where he right. put evidence in such a bad way that it makes him look even more ridiculous. And now him admitting he didn't research it makes him even worse because they did a show yeah. about it. And it just yeah. goes to that they were only out to make fucking money off of the back of fucking Stephen and his wrongful conviction. Well, and, and, and to uh, uh, I, my personal that they were doing it again to to Colburn. And whether he went into it willingly or not, I don't know. But uh, given that, um, well, all the other circumstances we've talked about many times, uh, got, he was talked into signing a contract, an exclusive deal with uh, convicting a murderer. Greg Spock telling him, you know, you really shouldn't be doing any of these other interviews. You know, we can get your story out later. <coughs> mm-hmm. So, right, these are quotations. Uh, this this is only four pages. These are quotations from his book. They look like they've got highlighted here. Uh, I'll read this one right here. Indefensible recounts my independent search for the truth about the Stephen Avery case. I thought I knew the truth, but it was to some extent fractured by making a murderer. As I delved deeper into the circumstances surrounding Tisar Hallbach's murder, the truth became whole again. I don't know what the fuck that means. But okay. That is so stupid. Don't oh, buy that. Give me a break. Uh, Alice, you want to read this next one? Yep. By its skillful use of film and sound techniques and omissions of facts that belied its conclusion, making a murderer has all but convicted two intelligent, honest, and well-respected police officers are planting evidence to frame Avery a second time. This is a narrative now widely accepted by legions of Netflix viewers whose only familiarity with the Avery case is the documentary itself. Oh, brother. Yeah, we've only watched the documentary and that's all we base everything on. Mm -hmm. And we Mm -hmm. called Justify at trial and and, uh, put put Bree Spock in his place that we've all... We've even open records requested records of our own. <laughs> so, like, uh, yeah. Well, we've all done mere fucking research at the I time don't... that we found the case that he ever did for his fucking Eddie's books. Apparently, is this a second book you're talking that you're reading from right here? Yeah, yeah indefensible. Yeah. yeah. Let's That's... remember now. Didn't Brenda Schuler help the research of this book? <laughs> Correct. Okay. Yeah. That is correct. Because she, she, so she got, she's not only involved in writing his book, she's writing his motions. It, it <laughs> like I asked, I, I had remembered my question. My question for Barb, for when Barb Colburn had her little thing here, she says that it consumed him, this case, this defamatory <laughs> thing. So do you think it would have consumed him so much if he didn't have people that were, that he was participating in convicting, that he was participating with Mike Griesbach in the way that he was. Do you think if those people weren't in his life to keep pushing this this defamatory agenda, do you, do you think it would have it would have played out? Do you think it would have consumed him as much as it has that he's gone? Well, you know the fact that he's only watched an hour and a half of it. I think you're probably right. I do too. How could he be so consumed by an hour and a half? And, um, and now we have, oh. and now we have her helping write this book where he now he's like, okay, here's my here's my uh, what do they call it? My declaration. Here's my book of what I think. But 
Is that what you think, or is that what Brenda Schuler thinks? <laughs> right. It is such a convoluted mess. You know, when we found out about the the depths of these connections, it, it's it's a disaster. I mean, I mean, to me, Who's looking the common at common denominator and all of this shit from the uh-huh. Friesbach book to the Kratz book to the convicting television show and this lawsuit. Who's and the who lawsuit? Is, and who is yeah. the common denominator person? It is a Gilbert right? named Brenda Schuler. <laughs> Well, and, and all the uh, open records requests and uh, uh, friends with, you know, Larry and, you know, Remaker and, uh, you know, this, the, the various emails that we've seen. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, when we found out about the rest of the stuff here, you know, six, eight, seven months ago, I was blown away. I was like, whoa. I mean, it, you know, it's one thing to be involved, kind of like we are. We're doing our, our own thing. You know, we, 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 uh, open records request different pieces of information. Hopefully some of it's helpful for the case to give it to Zellner. Uh, otherwise continuing to make a bigger, more full picture of the story that so much shit got left out. And we're so far ahead of making a murder. It's not even funny. Um, and to find out the depth of her involvement, it's far more than any of us. As far as I know, far yeah. more. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So, and now a producer who could be sued if convicting gets out and somebody doesn't like the way they are portrayed, <laughs> which means <laughs> she's also getting paid. So she's being paid. How do they put it? They they get mad because you're making money off Teresa Halbach's, uh, you know, mm-hmm. she's the victim. Well, aren't you doing the same thing <laughs> by writing well, books well, e- and, e- e- and producing and researching shit for these cases? Well, even as far as, you know, Stephen and Brendan being locked up, you know, making money off the, the backs of, of them being, you know, in the situation they're in. It's kind of along that, that same line. That's right. Anyway, let's, uh, let's, let's move forward here. I'll read this next one. Clinging to the claims of objectivity, the documentarians have pointed out that truth is elusive in the Stephen Avery case, which is true enough. However, by excluding facts that don't fit their aim and manipulating others, they have distorted the truth beyond recognition and have decided for the rest of us what we are to believe. Quote, highbrow vigilante justice, end quote, is how the columnist Catherine Schultz put it in her column about the documentary in the New New Yorker. Uh, He's quoted dead certainty, to which I respond, Quote, unquote, right on. This is fucking ridiculous. Yep. Distorted the truth beyond, uh, what was it, all recognition or something? Yep. I mean, come on. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, bro. what's the truth? Because I'm still looking for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah no shit. Yeah, absolutely. What is the fucking truth? All right. So let's turn that off. Oh, that's right. He's going to lose. <laughs> <laughs> With the help of Michael Griesbuck. <laughs> My dad. And we'll, uh, we'll read a few more here. Let me get them pulled up. Kelly says, why do they not give at least one fact that was left out? Oh, the the sweat DNA on the hood latch. Well, no one accused Colburn of planting that. That was uh, Uyghurd or uh, accidental by Tyson because he admitted at trial that he may or may not have changed his gloves going from Avery's car to <laughs> Teresa, right? Like that was right. that that was his admission at court, if I remember right. <clears throat> so not not Colburn there, so it don't matter about it doesn't matter about Tyson's integrity. <laughs> Just <Yeah>. Colburn's <laughs> According to Colburn, it's all about him. <laughs> whether it is or not. It is very narcissistic that, uh-huh. you know, when there were other people depicted in MAM that 
can be looked at as nefarious, not just the officers even, you know, like. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. You had at least Ryan and Bobby and Scott that came across wrong, like that, like something was there or that you should search uh -huh. into that. You know, that's what I wanted to do when I watched, ma'am. I wanted to know more. I wanted to know why he was still in prison. Where are the records? And I don't think if the records came out like they did, people would still be so involved, to be honest. Oh, absolutely. You know, you know that's something we recognized right away, you know, when a bunch of us got together and crowdsourced uh, all that money. You know, because we didn't have anything but some newspaper clippings, a couple of documents here and there. And a little bit we could gather from the the series itself we had literally nothing so we had a convoluted brian's blog that he wrote during trial yep. and a little after trial some some articles after trial and it was so busy that you you'd go there and you couldn't even open the page because it was so busy with everyone else opening the page. that's right wow. it's bogged down yeah it bogged the website down so mm -hmm. much yeah bandwidth wise Okay, this next one um, is a declaration of uh, Deborah, Deborah L. Bursick. Um, Alice, you want to read this one? If you're muted again. <laughs> yeah, sure. No problem. <clears throat> uh, Deborah L. Bursick being first duly sworn on oath, deposes and says, Number one, I work by contract for the law firm of Conway and Olajewenskik and Jerry. Submit this declaration in support of plaintiff's brief in opposition to defendant's motion for summary judgment. If I were asked to testify, I would testify consistent with this declaration and I have personal knowledge of all the facts set forth herein. Number two, attached as Exhibit 1 are defendants Laura Riccardi, Moira Demos and Crow Media LLC's response and objections to plaintiff's seventh request for production of documents. Number three, attached as Exhibit 2 is a letter from attorney Kevin Vick dated August 26, 2022, on defendant's response to discovery, differentiates diff deficiencies. deficiencies raised by the plaintiff. Number four, attached as Exhibit 3 is a letter from attorney Christina Summers, dated August 23, 2022, regarding defendant's di discovery deficiencies. Number five, I have reviewed the discovery provided by defendants Laura Riccardi, Moira Demos and Chrome Media LLC and found that only five emails produced after December 18th, 2015. Number six, attached as Exhibit 4, is an article wrote by John Frack that was located on the internet, dated this fourth day of November 2022. All righty. And uh, we've got uh, four attachments to this document that she made. And let me see. So, so what have they asked for seven times that they haven't gotten? Uh, this is a 19 page document. So, uh, this was a question and answer because she said that in this first one was uh, responses and so. Let me, let me make this a little so bit bigger. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. So we'll go through, we'll go through. The, yeah. I don't know. We'll go through these here and see what, see what they want. Okay. Defendants Law, Riccardi, Mordemos, and Chrome Media LLC responses and objections to the plaintiff's seventh request for production of. Defendants Chrome Media and so forth and so forth, production. Um, I'll just start here. General response and general objections. One, the producer defendants are responding to their quest as they interpret and understand them. The producer defendants preserve the right to supplement their objections and or responses herein if Colburn subsequent, subsequently asserts an interpretation of the request that differs from the producer defendants understanding. 
Two, the producer defendants object to the request in their entirety and to and to each individual request to the extent that they are not proportional to the needs of the case, considering the parties relative access to relevant information, the parties, resources, and importance of the discovery in resolving the issues and the burden and expense that will result to the producer dependence in locating and producing the requested documents, if they even exist, compared to the to any benefit uh, to Coburn or relevant relevance to the Three, the producer defendants object to each request to the extent that each calls for a material that is produced from discovery by attorney-client privilege or product a doctrine and common interest and or joint defensive privilege, tax return privilege, or any other applicable privilege, doctrine, or immunity. Nothing contained in these responses and objections is attended as or nor should it be in any way deemed a, a waiver of any attorney-client privilege, work product doctrine, common interest and or joint defensive privilege, tax return privilege, or any other applicable privilege, doctrine, or immunity. No such waiver will result from any inadvertent disclosure of material or information protected from discovery by the attorney-client privilege, attorney work product, um, work, attorney work product doctrine, the common interest, and so forth and so on that I've already read twice. Number four, the producer defendants object to each request to the extent that it calls for the disclosure of material that is confidential, proprietary, and or private, or that it intrudes upon 30 third parties' privacy or other legal interests. Number five, the producer defendants object to each request to the extent that it calls for disclosure of material protected from disclosure under Article One, Statute 2B of the California Constitution, California Evidence Code Section 1070, Wisconsin Statutes and 8815-14, and the 80, and the Wisconsin Constitution and in any other applicable states or jurisdictions reporters privilege or shield laws, the First and Fourteenth Amendment to the United States Constitution and or the common law reporters privilege. Number six, producer defendants object to each request to the extent that they seeks to impose obligations upon the producer defendants greater than those imposed by the federal rules of civil procedure and or the local rules of the Eastern District of Wisconsin. Number seven, the producer defendants object to the request to the extent that they seek information protected from disclosure by any statute, rule, or regulation. Number eight, the producer defendants object to the request to the extent that they seek information, one, not currently in the producer defendant's possession, custody, or control, or two, that the producer defendants cannot locate after a reasonable, diligent search. The producer defendants also object to the request to the extent that they seek subject the producer defendants to an unreasonable and undue annoyance, oppression, burden, and expense, and, and or seek to impose upon the producer defendants an obligation to investigate or discover information or materials from sources equally accessible to Uh Number nine, the producer defendants object to each request to the extent that it is vague, over overbroad, and unduly burdensome and costly to the producer defendants. And finally, number 10, notwithstanding the specificity, specificity, that word kills me, of the producer defendants, responses set forth below the producer defendants expressly incorporate this general response and these general objections by reference as though fully set forth into its specific objections to each of the requests. Thus, if any objection contained above is not, is not restated under the specific response to an individual request, then it, this sh should not be considered as a waiver of any such objection. So now they're getting into the re response responses to request for production request uh, request for production number one. Alice, you want to read for a little bit, then we can kind of swap back and forth. Yeah, sure. Request for production number one. All documents and communications between you and any persons relating to the allegations and claims asserted in the Second Amendment complaint and or the challenge statements. 
response to request for production number one. The producer defendants incorporate by reference each objection set forth in the general response and general objections above, as are fully stated here. The producer defendants further object to this request as vague, ambiguous, overboard and unduly burdensome. The producer defendants also object to this request to the extent that it calls for material that is protected from discovery by the attorney-client privilege, work product doctrine, the common interest and or joint defence privilege, or any other applicable privilege, doctrine or immunity including, without limitation, the applicable reporter's privilege and or reporter's shield under Wisconsin, California and any other applicable state or jurisdiction, federal and or common law. The producer defendants further object to this request to the extent it calls for material disclose, disclosing a trade secret or other confidential research source development or commercial information and or material protected from disclosure by the producer defendants and or third parties rights of material that is not relevant or reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of any admissible evidence and to the extent it is not proportional to the needs of the case and would impose an undue burden and expense on the producer defendants. The producer defendants object to the extent that plaintiff is requesting discovery regarding making a murderer too. As the operative Second Amendment complaint does not put making a murderer too at issue, and thus discovery regarding it is not relevant or reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of any admissible evidence. It is not proportional to the needs of the case and is overboard and unduly burdensome. Subject to and without waiving their objections and subject to their understanding of this request, the producer defendants response as follows. To the extent not already produced, the producer defendants will produce non-privileged documents within their possession, custody, or control that reasonably can be determined to be responsive to this request that are between the producer defendants and other persons and that mention plaintiff and relate to portions of a making a murderer that are put at issue by the second amended complaint. Request for production number two. All documents and communications in that any way mention plaintiff or James Link in any defend defendant's possession. What the fuck does James Link have to do with it? Exactly. I, I saw that too. And I'm like, what, are these on a big old fishing trip? God yeah. Dang. Response to request for production number two. The producer defendants incorporate by reference each objection set forth in the general response and general objections above as if fully stated here. The producer defendants further object to this request as vague, ambiguous, overboard and unduly burdensome. The producer defendants also object to this request to the extent that it calls for material that is protected from discovery by the attorney-client privilege, work product doctrine, the common interest and or joint defence privilege, or any other applicable privilege, doctrine or immunity, including without limitations the applicable reporter's privilege and or reporter's shield under Wisconsin, California, any other applicable state or jurisdiction, federal or and or common law. The producer defendants further object to this request to the extent it calls for material disclosure, a trade secret or other confidential research, source development or commercial information and or material protected from disclosure by the producer defendants and or third parties rights of privacy. The producer defendants also object to this request on the grounds that it seeks material that is not relevant or reasonable, reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of any admissible evidence and to the extent it is not proportional to the needs of these 
needs of the of the case and would impose an undue burden and expense on the producer defendants. The producer defendants object to the extent that plaintiff is requesting discovery regarding making a murder of two, as the operative Second Amendment complaint does not put making a murder of two at issue, and thus discovery regarding it is not relevant or reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of any admissible evidence. It is not proportional to the needs of the case and is overboard and unduly burdensome. The producer defendants also object to this request to the extent it calls for documents not within their possession. Subject to and without waiving their objections and subjects to their understanding of this request, the producer defendants response as follows. To the extent not already produced, the producer defendants will produce non-privileged documents within their possession, custody or control that reasonably can determine to be responsive to this request that mention plaintiff or James Blank and that relate to portions of making a murderer that are put at issue by the second amended complaint. I'm going to, I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop right here because I'm, I'm going to guess that these responses are pretty much yeah. uh, the same for each one because they're asking that one was for James Link and, and they two times asked for things for making murder two, which was not in the second amended complaint. It all involved part one of the series. So, uh, yeah, I, agree. Get, I think we should just read what the requests are. Yeah, let's just do that. So, Alice, if you just want to read what the requests are, then we can skip on because I think the responses are the same. All right, right. Request product number three, all documents and communications that in any way mention an antagonist in any defendant's possession. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> And then number four. And all documents and communications that reference James Link and Sheriff Ken Peterson were aware of the 1995 call that is uh, the subject to this lawsuit prior to 2000. More fish. Yep. And number five. All documents and communications that reference the plaintiff was on the verge of being named in the civil lawsuit brought by Stephen Avery prior to Hallback murder. And then number six. And number six. All documents and communications that in any way mention Kevin Ramlow in defendant's possession. That's interesting. Uh-huh. And number seven. All documents and communications relating plaintiff's call to dispatch as referenced in paragraphs 30 to 40 of the second amended complaint. So the Coburn call, they want that. Okay. And then number eight. Number A, all documents and communications relating to plaintiff and James Link's searches of the Stephen Avery's trailer in connection with Teresa Hallback. Okay, number nine. <clears throat> number nine, all documents and communications relating to the key to Teresa Hallback's SUV referenced in paragraphs 41 to 45 of the second amended complaint including but not limited to its location at all times, its discovery in Stephen Avery's trailer, and any DNA found on it. Well, that, that's interesting because, I mean, a couple, I mean, especially this one and uh, probably the last two, all this stuff is easily obtainable through open records request, which is yeah. how the rest of it. I went too far. Number 10, I went too far. There. Uh, number 10. Please produce a copy of all documents and communications, computer files or telephone records obtained 
from law enforcement showing any evidence of phone calls or dispatch notes from November 2005 involving the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department. This should include, but is not limited to, CAD reports, dispatch narratives, incident reports, telephone bills or records and time printouts. What again, the fuck? Again, <laughs> open records request. Get it your damn self. Jesus Christ. They, no all shit. The, why? Brother. <laughs> oh, I went to, to, I went to. All documents that you No, contain, no, 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 no. Number 11. I, I, I skipped one. Number 11. All documents that you intend to use as exhibits at trial. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, number 12. Number 12. All documents that you contend constitute admissions against interest by plaintiff. <sighs> what? Yeah, it's so broad. I mean, my God. What the hell? I thought the burden of proof fell on Colburn. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Absolutely. You provide the records that show that you didn't plant evidence other than your word. You. And this is, and they've requested this shit seven times. You say that there's evidence. So where is, why isn't he getting the phone records showing anything? Yeah. yeah. To That's disprove. One. What they said in ma'am. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. And they didn't have the calls, remember, for how long? Not time-stamped ones, at least. And then, poof, all of a sudden, this year, they just appeared. Uh-huh. Huh. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, this is uh, the second attachment. Uh... Looks like via email. This is from the Jesse Bick. This is uh, the, yeah, okay. The Kevin Bick's uh, August 16, 2022. Uh, looks like it's to Christina Summers, George Burnett, and April Rockstead Bark. This is a six page document. I don't want to get into reading a whole bunch of something that we don't need to read here. I'm checking it out here. Susan, have you read this one? Do you remember it offhand? No, but I think this was probably included earlier. This is about August. Um, I don't remember. Uh, plaintiff's failure to timely raise his concerns justifies the This is filed eleven four. It was about their meet and confer back in July. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, they cited a bunch of case law. Which defendants have been reasonable and accommodating with respect to discovery, including and agreeing, including agreeing to permit plaintiffs to make to take multiple third party depositions after the expiration of the deadline to do so. However, <laughs> plaintiffs have never explained why, in the exercise of diligence and good faith, he could not have raised the issue now being belatedly addressed months ago at an appropriate time. Uh, Yeah, I, I just text messages. Yeah, um, I don't think it's important I, I don't, to read this stuff. I mean, yeah, I, I don't remember reading this one. I'm not saying that we didn't, but I, I do think a lot of it's old news that's been kind of rehashed again. Yeah. I'm not sure why it's in here, to tell you the truth. 
Well, well they're bitching. The owner does it too. That they add like one or one or two records of the same record every time they have to file a motion, so that the judge looks at it, right? Like, oh, maybe this is about them asking one. You know, the seven times they've asked for this shit and about right. them discussing it. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, this is. August 26th. I can't believe that. I, I think we probably got this. I don't remember that we, we read it, but yeah, I think that you're exactly right, Susan. So we're, let's just yeah. move on. It's going to be yeah. listed if anybody wants to read it. They're, they're more than welcome, but I don't think there's anything of any real relevance. And here's See another. You, silky. Sugar. Silky, you got to go. Sugar's leaving. Oh, no. All right, Doc. You have a good one. This is a three-page document. And this is from... Uh, kind of the same. Well, this is from Conway, Alonziak, and, and Jerry. And to Kevin Vick. I think it's about the same thing. Deficiencies. Yes, it is. Yeah. Received no responses. Yeah. Send a follow-up letter on July 28th, blah, 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 Chrome Media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, again, this is back in August. I'm sure we've got this somewhere. So let's yeah. move on. Let's, let's move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This is uh, Attachment 4, and Andy Colburn tried to sue Buting, String, and John Frack. And this looks like a patch That's article. Right. This is from the patch. Yep. Uh -huh. um, there's eight pages here. I'm going to guess that uh, there's a story and then a bunch of attachments of ads and different things. I don't know. Let's just see. You're right. Um, for purposes of this case, I have agreed not to assert that quote making a murder caused my divorce. Andy Coburn declined under oath in July. Yeah, I bet you did. <laughs> <laughs> because it didn't cause your divorce, you had a fishing trip to go. Okay, so this is actually the uh, looks like the story. So they're what, using the story he just wrote in September when he find when John Farrah found out because of the evidence that came out during this yep. deposition yep. that yep. he wanted yep. to not only sue. Uh, Netflix and, and, and Laura and Moira, but he wanted to also sue Buting. So John Farrick wrote an article and now that is in this, you know, like, uh -huh. mm -hmm. how pathetic, like he's, he's like saying, see, they're still defaming me. This is about your lawsuit. You're defaming yourself by suing Netflix. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, he, he even says here, my relationship with Miss Moore also boring. harmed my relationship with my adult children. Yeah. That's in his depot. Yeah, this is the article. We don't need to read it. I have no, I mean, it's going to be. Yeah. He wrote about it, basically. <laughs> well, basically, yeah. You know, it's basically everything that we already know anyway. So, all right. Let's, uh, let me look here just once. Let me turn that off. Yeah, we've been at it about three hours. Why don't we call it here? Oh, call, yeah. call the ball. Yeah, I like it. And that was interesting. Some good stuff in there. Yeah. Let me get I, final thoughts for Silkman. <laughs> What'd you say? Gonna lose, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we can't take now, a. He might use this, you know, he might use this video, Jinx. Your name might be next. <laughs> That's right. You gotta be. <laughs> Colburn, his defamation. it is my humbled opinion after reading all of this stuff and knowing that you know nothing <laughs> and your lawyers do not know nothing and those lawyers are, are ripping you a new uh, a-hole that you're going to lose <laughs> <laughs> I'll second that uh, let's take a moment, uh, just a brief moment here and we can go down the list and anybody that's got any after, after thoughts that we can give them and then we can close her out. Alice? I mean, it's, it's a joke. The whole bloody thing is a joke. 
Um, and I can't see how he's going to get past summary judgment. I mean, the documents that we've just read, seven times they've been asking for stuff, and he's still not handed it over. And the last wee ones there that, that we were looking at was um, that the, the stuff that he was asking for were, you know, they, they weren't even relevant to the case. I mean, how all of a sudden is fucking James Link, James Link being brought into the picture? Absolutely. It's James Link, you know what and, I mean? And, 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 st and stuff from making a murder too. Yeah. Right. Yeah, which... Isn't he in any of the other papers that he's done? I mean, why not when he first put this? It's what is in Making a Murderer 1 and Making a Murderer 2. It's no, it's just been one. You know what I mean? So for him and now, because he knows that he might be losing and he's not going to get anywhere, he's now trying to put another spanner in the works and say, oh, but wait a minute, there's bits in Ma'am too. Well, how the fuck do you know if you've not watched it? Exactly. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Susan? Take the oh, swing. I'll just say that, man, that Lady Walker, she is a rock star. That was so well written. It was so easy as a layperson to completely understand how ridiculous this whole lawsuit is. And I, I really appreciate that. But you know, she just spelled it out. And it's just, I'm just amazed at Colburn's attorneys and how stupid they are to bring all this stuff. They have to know. I mean, don't they know the fucking law? Absolutely. You know, and and his burden, you know, to prove uh, defamation and all of that. Uh, yeah, I did. I enjoyed that. I hadn't read that. Um, that their uh, response to his uh, motion for partial summary judgment. And yeah, I'm, 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 it was awesome. I agree. That's the best part of the night, I think. Absolutely. Nixie? Yeah. Closing, closing thoughts? I already said them. He's going <laughs> to lose. He's going to lose. <laughs> And and I just burst out laughing when you said Colburn's lawyers are so stupid because they are. Yeah. <laughs> or not to laugh at them. It's like, what, where did you get your law degree? Right. She, she spelled it out so easily. You can't call this malice. And it's going to put into, you know, everybody's freedom of speech, basically. <laughs> if you rule on this. And then he's like, oh, I, I, I'm stupid. Here's some plenty of records that don't mean shit. It's like, I thought ma'am was the stupidest case, but now I'm seeing that Homer's civil suit is. Yep, Talk absolutely. about a waste of the court's time. God. Mm. Right? Exactly. Huge, huge waste. And uh, nearly. And who pays for that time? L really? In a civil suit? Do, like, who pays the judge's salaries and stuff for the, the civil suit? Is that... Is that paid for by the lawyers, or is that no, still paid that's, by the tax well, dollars well, of, the, of the citizens of, of Wisconsin? Well, there's a court cost. Yeah, there are court there are court costs. I don't know exactly how that's built in, but there are definitely court costs, and I'm guessing that you know it has to defray the cost of the judge and the stenographer and blah blah blah. But yeah, absolutely. This is being paid for partially by the state of Wisconsin. And absolutely. All the there. I would be pissed. <laughs> absolutely. Nearly. I think we put Neverly asleep. Neverly. She might just be getting off work or. Oh, uh, that's true. I didn't think about that because that's around that time for her. She might be driving. Something. Yeah. Sammy? Yeah. Closing thoughts? I just want to say Coburn has caused himself more pain and more damage than good. So, you know, he should have held his, his investigators, his police department, um, buddies a little more accountable he wouldn't be in this mess yep totally agree well said and you, you know um uh, having to walk back you know the numerous things that he filed on to begin with now he's had to walk everything pretty much back to the precipice and now they're wanting to hang on to this i've seen some comments on reddit uh, maybe a couple on twitter you know they're wanting to hang on to this uh Raw camera footage, camera A that's not wasn't broadcast worthy, and 
what, the, what are you trying to hide? You know, you, you want to seal this evidence. Well, there's a reason for that. Not only that, and we're just reading through tonight. I have to agree with Susan that document by Lita that we read second or third one we read. It, it was perfect and so easy to read. So easy. Um, it, it, it was legal sounding at the same time, easy to get to and understand. But then these guys, these jokers come along here and they're naming off all these these, these 78 points and they, they miss how many how many mistakes? Just We just read through a few of them. And there was like three or four mistakes right off the bat. They didn't even couldn't even get the episode in time right. Like, what? So. And then the case law that was totally not the wrong case law. To yes, quote. absolute. <laughs> Decide. Oh, jeez. Yeah, okay. Judge. I I can't imagine Judge Ludwig is going to look fondly upon this at all. Just based so either. Based on what we've heard him, how he even talk, he's a he seems a very fair jurist. He's I think he's given the plaintiff a huge amount of uh, rope, maybe to hang himself with, or just to say, "Hey, we're going to let you go." But at this point, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't see it. I don't know what Ludwig could potentially grab on on anything that's been presented so far. That he could say, no, we're not giving you summary judgment. We're going to move forward to the next step. I, I don't see it. Sorry, I don't. I have a quick no, I, I, I see Netflix and uh, Chrome getting summary judgment and the whole thing getting dropped. That's so what I, I see. That's what I see, too. You mean he's going to lose? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I do. Question, by the way, the... the the document that states that uh, Netflix produced two episodes of the Rick Mueller interview with Hot and Not, what, which one is that? Which document? The what? No. Oh, which exhibit? Oh, uh, oh, the document? Oh, I can send it to Mark. I'm going to send it to Mark. Uh, I'll have to go. Um, well, when you was... find it. Jim, yeah, you know, yeah, I'll have to look back through them. It was like, um, we're up to like, let me see here. I think I made a note of that. Let's see. Check those notes. Check those notes. <laughs> yeah, if we're on three sixteen dash four, it was it was somewhere around the three ten or three twelve mark, somewhere around in there. I don't know. It's not too far back. I, we can easily find it. Yeah. What one else will get it to? All right, cool. I will, um, after we get done here next little while, I will post links to all the documents we've covered so far. Uh, the next uh, live, I probably won't do one Wednesday. That's a special day for, for us. So maybe Thursday, we'll start again on uh, whatever the next damn document is. And uh, we'll continue on. Anybody got anything else for we Uh, there was one, um, let me see, there was one comment by Catnip that I thought was worth uh, repeating. She said they used Andy's lawyer's own case in point in one of their sites. I'm trying to find that comment so I can have. His lawyers had defended somebody. Uh, I forget what it was. Oh, in that car, in that car, in, in that car wreck. Yeah, maybe it was. Yeah, I think. So. <laughs> That's pretty funny. It is. Well, um, all right. Well, I'd certainly like to thank our super mods for being around. I, I I haven't had a really a chance to follow the chat too much. I didn't see any of the bots of our favorite bots around, but if they were, I'm glad you guys were there to kill them. Um. All of, you know, good comments and, you know, keeping up with this case. It, it is an important case to follow. Um, I'd like to thank everybody that's came into the Discord. Appreciate it. And um, for comments, thanks for, and Sammy, good to see you. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank and you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll, like I said, we'll do this again. We've got Jeff Jones tomorrow night. Uh, he's moved uh 
discussing a murder to Tuesday nights to, so that we're not, we don't have a conflict with Monday night football, which we are in conflict now because it's on now. So, um, you know, we, we realize that and people got to work and so forth. So we'll, we'll wrap it up here. But again, thanks everyone. We'll, uh, and I'll get something scheduled, uh, probably for Thursday, uh, probably around the same time. And we'll, uh, keep on keeping. <laughs> I don't know how many more documents will get filed between now and then, but uh, uh, hopefully not too many more. Anyway, with that said, this has been a file play production.